Welcome back to the second part of the Romanov dynasty. Last week, we took a look at the from first Romanov, Mikhail Romanov, to Kat, the reign of Catherine the Great. And this week, we're going to take a look at the Romanov dynasty from Pavel the First, or as he is known as in the West, Paul the First, to Nicola, Nicholas the Second in 1970, who died in 1918. And my guest this week is again Sergei Antonov. And I mean, the last week we ended with Catherine the Great's reign, but this week, and we don't to begin with Pavel in a second, but I want to go back a little bit because we forgot to mention something that's kind of important to not just Russian history, but Prussian and Austrian history as well, because that is the event of the partitioning of Poland. So I want to begin with the, how they the carved up Poland between Prussia, Russia, and Austria, Hungary. So let's begin with uh, the part, partition portion of uh, Poland and how this became become important later in the Roman of history. Yes, so hello, Ireland. Uh, it's wonderful to do this again. And I really enjoyed our conversation last week. And uh, let's uh, pick it up from there. So uh, uh, this is a really important subject, uh, of course. Uh, that I think Poland is going to come up a couple of more times during our uh, during our conversation today. Uh, and um, I think it's absolutely correct that the three partitions of Poland um, in the late 18th century, 1972, uh, uh, 93 and uh, 95 uh, were, uh, I mean, it was one of the most striking events uh, in terms of just, uh, you know, public policy in terms of international relations, because Poland um, Poland, Lithuania, um, as a, because since it was officially two call uh, two um, uh, two separate uh, realms that were joined together um, back in the 16th century and actually even earlier in the 14th was a personal union. It was one of the it was probably the largest by land mass other than Russia. It was the largest uh, state in Europe and it definitely was one of the wealthiest and most powerful our early modern especially um states so it had a large army it was wealthy it had cities uh and now it's just disappeared off the map of europe um all of a sudden i mean it was a bit of sh shocking and you know unprecedented uh there were obviously examples when like smaller states would be conquered by their neighbors but you know by the 18th century you gen generally had a certain international system formed especially after the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, right? There was this understanding there was a certain number of independent states in Europe and uh, you know, countries didn't just go around annexing and dismembering them. Uh, so that said, uh, Poland, Lithuania uh, ran into uh, a lot of difficulties uh, beginning in the, in the 17th century, which you know, we're not going to discuss here, but essentially the sort of the power, the political and the military power uh, of the Polish uh, state declined uh, beginning in the mid 17th century, and this basically would continue. Um, so that for actually most of the 18th century, Poland was, um, I mean, it was basically, a, I don't want to say dependency, but it was very heavily under Russian influence. Uh, earlier in the 18th century, it would be basically the French uh, and the Russians that would be just contesting this influence. But you know, by the time you get to the 1770s, um, a very sort of large uh, number of the Polish aristocracy, you know, people who were making decisions, they were essentially, you know, allied with the Russians, and you know, others, of course, were uh, were were not allied. And in the Polish case, we have one of the first examples of you know, we can call like a modern, uh, you know, modern European uh, nationalism. You know, there obviously there are different kinds of nationalism, and we're you know the idea that. There's certain ethnic identity uh, uh, that does or should correspond with political borders. Um, know that there are other examples of nationalisms, like the British one, that was very different. Uh, you know, it's obviously the French nationalism that's developing in the late 18th century. But, uh, but, but this kind of like structure, when uh, you have this attempt to build a nation state uh, at the same time as there are very powerful foreign influences that are trying to, you know, to dismember it and weaken it. This is kind of like a very typical um, sort of paradigmatic, I guess we can say, case of this of the Polish monarchy, uh, and then sort of later nationalisms, including you know, the Ukrainian one, for example, or the Russian one, 
you know, they're going to be looking mostly to this kind of Polish example of how to build a nation. Uh, and by the time we get to the 1770s, you know, there's this really um, sort of tangle of foreign policy interests. So, you know, there's Catherine the Great, and then there are you know, rulers of Austria and Prussia. Uh, and uh, they, I mean, it's a, Catherine was basically persuaded uh, to um, uh, to kind of to to create this kind of arrangement uh, where basically each of the three major Central European monarchies would get you know, a piece of Poland. Um, in part, you know, so the story goes, it was to distract Catherine from uh, what she really, really wanted to do with herself uh, in the 1770s, which was the so-called Greek project. So in other words, she was toying with this idea of uh, uh, dismembering not Poland, but the Ottoman Empire and setting up um, a Christian empire um, in Greeks and part of Turkey. She wanted to right. re recreate the Byzantine Empire, basically. Essentially, yeah. essentially, essentially, absolutely. Uh, and that was one of the reasons, you know, why she started this kind of lively expansion in what is was known as New Russia, right? And today it's southern Ukraine and South Russia. Uh, so she started that expansion, for, even for children. Uh, the oldest one was named Alexander, um, kind of thinking about Alexander the Great, perhaps. And uh, the next one was Constantine. And she had these ideas about putting him on a throne of this like reconstituted Byzantine Empire. And so for, you know, for example, for the Austrians uh, who had their own interests in the Balkans. These are, of course, Paul, we should mention that his Alexander and Constantine was Paul or Pavel, as we prefer calling him, was, I mean, they were Pavel's children, so her grandchildren, of course. Yes. So uh, exactly. There were Pavel's grandchildren. There was a little bit of a division. So Pavel had four uh, boys, uh, right, and and they were kind of divided into pairs basically. So the the old ones, um, Alexander and Constantine, they were mostly brought up by Catherine herself, um, because just you know, so that kind of like brings us a little bit into Pavel's earlier history. You know, he was not exactly imprisoned by his own mother, but his abilities as a politician were severely limited in his younger years as the heir to the throne. Uh, so basically, his older kids were kind of taken away and brought up by the grandmother, uh, whereas the two younger one, uh, Nicholas, the future Nicholas the First, you know, Nikolai in Russian, and then Mikhail uh, or Michael, the younger one that you know we don't really need to worry about right now, they were basically brought up mostly by uh, Pavel himself, and uh, you know they were very different uh, different personalities. Um, so yes. No, so essentially, that's one first I, re I remember as well. Pavel, he didn't grow up, he grew up under Elizabeth, I believe, and most of the control over him during his her reign before she died. So he like, didn't see much of his mother again. And this was so, this wasn't uncommon that you know, like you mentioned Alexander, and then the Constantine would grow up in the Catherine, and we could see, saw this again with his, their father, Pavel, who grew mm -hmm. up under Elizabeth, as we whom, of course, died, died quite, well, quite a while ago. But we see this, it wasn't uncommon that they would grow up mm -hmm. under their grandmother's, under their grandmother yes. or grandfather's reign. Mm -hmm. And they were harmed yes. in that way. So that essentially kind of ties in this kind of question of foreign political adventures and such things that you would think are not related, which is how do you br bring up and educate uh, the heirs to the throne, or at least you know, royal or no, imperial children, um, children, siblings, and so on. Uh, and uh, it is important to remember that yeah, the 18th century Romanov monarchy was, you know, it was still unstable. It wasn't really a dynasty to speak of, uh, right? Uh, it was very kind of it could have died out any minute, basically. Whereas by contrast, we're getting in the 19th century, we get you know flocks and flocks of Ramanovs running around to the point where the later Tsars didn't know what to do with them. Uh, so, but uh, but essentially, yes, yeah, so instead of uh, expanding into the Balkans, which um, Catherine really couldn't get um, any foreign support for, uh, she had to contend herself with, uh, um, with, with chunks of the former Polish kingdom. And, and the bits that she ended up joining to the Russian Empire were parts to the east of the so-called, in the 20th century, it was called the Curzon Line, right? So it's named after the British politician, Lord Curzon, who proposed this kind of division 
uh, between the, the reconstituted Polish state and the early Soviet Union that roughly followed the ethnic boundary between the Poles and the Eastern Slavs, you know, mostly Belarusians and Ukrainians. Um, there was, of course, a lot of, I mean, it was not a precise line uh, by any means because there were you know, many, many, many millions of Poles living to the east of it and many, many Ukrainians and Belarusians living to the west of it. But uh, roughly the, the lands that Catherine ended up uh, 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 joining in, annexing to the Russian Empire, were parts of the former medieval Eastern Slavic Kingdom uh, that uh, first the uh, Grand Dukes of Lithuania and then the Kings of Poland annexed uh, after the Mongol invasion. And they were subject to very heavy Polish cultural influence. And so the lands that Catherine got were the, was this very heavy mixture you know, in terms of ethnic identities, you know, you had Ukrainians, Belarusians, who were forming their own national identities at that at that point. There were Poles, there were many Jews, uh, there were Germans, uh, so it was very, very, very mixed area. Hmm. And but as we know that Pavel he grew, would grow up hating his mother. So what 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 caused this hate? And because as we will see in a second that he would. Hate her as so much, in fact, that he signed a deal treaty that would, ne would never allow women to rule Russia again as empresses. So, what what caused this tremendous hate for Pavel for his mother? Yes, well, I mean, it's um, uh, because in the 18th century, Russia had no laws of succession. Uh, and the, the only law that existed since Peter the Great, uh, as we mentioned, I think, last week, is that the Tsar. The reigning emperor uh, picked uh, his or her you know, own successor, which none of them managed to do, as we know, uh, until you know until Peter the Third, right? So then, uh, when Catherine took the throne, there was a very um, strong expectation that because Peter the Third had a son who was I don't remember how old he was, he was still a boy, but you know he was not a small boy. He was like what I don't know, 11, 10, 11, 12, something like that. Uh, that, 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 you know, Catherine would basically, as soon as uh, Paul would reach the age of majority, which I think for the emperors, it was 14. Um, so like in, in Russia had these weird rules about like what counts as majority, but I believe for the reigning emperor, it was 14, uh, that, that she would basically, you know, re remain in power as maybe a region, but that she would take all that, that she would surrender uh, her uh, you know, surrender the the actual power to to Paul and he would be the reigning emperor as soon as he was able to um, and that was kind of the expectation and that would be really logical in terms of just the political practice uh, in Europe at that time um, because you know Catherine was not related to the Romanovs by blood uh, and instead uh, she chose to do uh, you know, the opposite you know she was crowned as the empress and she. Uh, uh, obviously reigned until she died. Um, she was, you know, was not about to surrender her power at all. And so, yes, there was a lot of resentment. Um, uh, and listen, if we just, you know, this is not exactly a podcast on the history of, you know, dynasties and monarchies, but uh, it's kind of like a very typical situation, really, when the reigning ruler is trying to, uh, is basically being challenged uh, by his or her heir. And, and there's this really complex dynamic where on the one hand, the monarch wants to train his or her heir, right, to be a competent ruler and to take over. On the other hand, you don't want to train that heir too well or too early, because then they would easily depose you, uh, which which you know happened a lot. And so Catherine was under that kind of a uh, dilemma there. And so she's you know she's educating Paul as well as she can. Uh, Paul has this palace outside Petersburg, which you know you can visit today. If you go there, called Gatchina, uh, he even has his toy army of like several thousand soldiers um, that you know he's free to do with, as he you know whatever he wants to do with them. And uh, he even takes a grand tour of Europe uh, with his wife, uh, and basically just gets you know himself very very familiar with how you know how Europe operated. All of, and, and and he really kind of showed himself to be a very in inquisitive, curious. You know, well-educated, intelligent person. Uh, and, and I want to ask for a second because you know, and you mentioned that Catherine wanted all the power for herself. And I've seen in the Habsburg Empire during this time, Maria Theresia and yes. Joseph II had a co-rule 
in the in the so to train him to become a monarch, independent monarch. You think the teams would have been different if Catherine had chosen to do the same as Catherine, as sorry, Maria Theresa did with Joseph II that they had a co rule. Do you think it would have ended differently, perhaps, if she had chosen to do the same as the Habsburgs did at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very good question, and especially there's this uh, kind of another comparative point is that from what I remember from my rusty Habsburg history, Maria Theresa was also. I mean, there was some question about how she inherited the throne, right? Wasn't it called a pragmatic sanction or something like that? There was like a treaty that Habsburg nobles had to sort of agree to. Uh, but in any case, Maria Theresa was not a usurper. Like, you know, she did not seize power as a result of you know, a bloody armed coup. Uh, she didn't kill her husband, mm -hmm. uh, which is what Catherine the Great did. So I think like for her, just this kind of question of power was very, very questionable. Uh, but also another thing to keep in mind is that, uh, like any monarch, uh, no matter how dictatorial they might appear at first sight, uh, you know, like there's no such thing as like absolute power. And so she was reigning through, uh, you know, a couple of dozen basically of uh, generals, aristocrats, sort of like Pachomkin, but you know there were many, many others. There's a long list of these guys, and none of them wanted, you know, Paul to take over and. You know, and call them into account. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they felt like, well, so we have our Matushka Imperatrice. You know, we have our mother, the Empress, whom they just adored as this, you know, uh, wise and beautiful and powerful figure. But they also were given enough power of their own to sort of run things as they saw fit. And uh, as I said, it was kind of like it was a bit of a complicated game. Now, Paul or Pavel had no intention whatsoever for this kind of way of governing. Uh, to continue, and everybody knew it. So let's talk about Paul or Pavel taking over uh, after his coverage with them, because he was not a fan of military affairs, and he didn't seem to not just establish that, that now we're going to protect in turn what we got, that there's not going to be any more wars, there's not going to be, be any border expansions, we're going to just protect what we got for now. He was it did not seem to be a fan of wars or expansionism, from what well, I understand. Uh, yes and no, in the sense that I think you have a very good point in that uh, Russia, the Russian Empire under Paul, did not experience you know any kind of like major territorial acquisition, you know the way it did under you know Catherine the Great, uh, you know, whose reign just finished, uh, and you know the Russia would experience under Alexander the First. However, uh, I mean. Paul was extremely warlike, let's put it this way. Much like his father, Peter III, Paul was this huge admirer of Frederick the Great. Mm. Uh, so even if you look at all the portraits of Paul, he appears in these um, you know, uniforms that, you know, to us, of course, it doesn't matter what they look like, but to people at the time, they looked like these bizarre, hideous things. Uh, especially if you look at, you know, a man's hat was a big deal in 18th century, as it is today, actually. So Paul wore, wore these gigantic, enormous, tri-cornered hats that were very different from the early fashion of much smaller hats. Um, tight suits, giant hats, a lot of powder and wigs and, and braids and all this stuff that, you know, soldiers hated, basically. Uh, so Paul um, admired Prussian styles admired Prussian discipline uh, and he introduces all that into the army which is like hugely unpopular at the same time you know he likes order and you know not everybody hates order let's put it this way uh, and so I would say that if I had to serve in the Russian military in the late 18th century if I were an officer you know I would hate this with a passion however for you know private soldiers yeah it was really unpleasant to have to like powder yourself up several times a day at the same time, they were, you know, better fed and better housed and better taken care of. Uh, and such a classic Russian staple to this day as the overcoat, the big overcoat, the chenelle, uh, was uh, introduced under, you know, it was actually first introduced under Catherine, but under, you know, Paul, it became this kind of staple because it's basically like a blanket that you can, a blanket that you can also wear, you know, it was like this brilliant invention for that climate. Uh, so Paul was very much into military affairs. Um he was what the Russians called a parade maniac. In other words, he literally would not start a day without what the Germans called a Wachtparade, which is a watch parade. Like it's a kind of a ritualistic uh, 
assigning stations to palace guards. So he had a mini parade every freaking day, and he it was like his passed, coffee in the morning. So it speak. was his yes, absolutely <laughs> right. And his children were supposed to attend, and as soon as they were old enough to command, they were supposed to learn military drill. Uh, and and like and you know it's like if you watch a Red Square parade today, like you can sort of get an idea of what it was like. Except that what they did in the 18th century was like exponentially more complicated. It's like we're talking about you know prop the newspaper versus war and peace, uh, of 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 marching and parades and drills. So so Paul was very much into that part of the military discipline. It is true that like he wasn't really, you know, unlike uh, Frederick the Great himself. Uh, no, Paul never led armies in battle, and he never really intended to. Uh, and uh, he did get involved in quite a lot of military uh, affairs, but that would relate, was related mostly with the Russian response to the French Revolution mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sort of the Russian support for the uh, Central European monarchies in Britain, who were trying, you know, trying to suppress uh, to suppress suppress the revolutionary regime. And of course, with the French Revolution and rise of a certain Napoleone Bonaparte was uh, inevitable. And when he took power, he did, Paul seemed to be fascinated by Bonaparte, though he loathed the revolutionaries. He didn't seem to be fascinated by Bonaparte, who sent him envoys yeah. and gifts. And I, I was I just read, listening to an audiobook on Napoleon, and it, it seemed to me that it could have been if he hasn't been assassinated, that's a lot plausible for an alliance between France and Russia if he had still lived on. Is there any possibility of this, that this yeah. could happen if he had still lived? Right. lived? So, okay, so this is a really good question. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, so Tsar Paul, I mean, he basically inherited, originally inherited uh, Catherine the Great's course on you know fighting off the revolution. Uh, Paul would even like ban sort of contemporary French fashions, you know, certain styles of hats and so on, would ban imports of, you know, literature from abroad uh, because of the fear that, you know, revolutionary stuff will get in. So, so like, so Paul can be described that way as, you know, as an anti-revolutionary. On the other hand, in like many Tsars, as soon as he took over, he would pardon some of the Russian sort of more radical thinkers who were prosecuted, uh, persecuted under uh, Catherine the Great. So so basically what Paul did is that he joined this kind of European war against uh, the revolutionary French. I mean, at that point in, you know, 1798, uh, uh, 1799, you know, at that point, uh, Napoleon is, I mean, is a, is a, I think he's the first consul by that time, but, you know, he's not the emperor yet. Uh, and uh, when actually, when the Russian armies got to Western Europe, Napoleon was in Egypt. And so the top Russian general, the field marshal Suvorov, uh, who was this kind of military genius of the 18th century, you know, he never actually got to fight Napoleon himself. And given their big difference in age, you know, he would never get to. Uh, so basically what happened is that so the Russian armies, you know, they get first to Italy and then to Switzerland, and they just kind of like wipe out the French revolutionaries in a series of battles. Uh, basically, the French, for you know, all of their military prowess, just kind of completely unable to do anything about the Russians. So the problem was is that the, the Austrian monarchy and the Austrian uh, rulers became kind of jealous of, of what is happening. Like they didn't actually want like the Russians to get some kind of foothold in the Mediterranean uh, and basically started kind of sabotaging the Russian war effort, you know, doing things like, oh, we're going to have some supplies for you in this point, uh, and we're going to have an extra troops for you at that point, and like they would never do such a things. And so after this happened two or three times, and the Russian army was almost trapped in Switzerland by the French, uh, Paul basically had enough of that, um, and he rapidly, drastically changed his uh, diplomatic affiliation, and he actually did sign an alliance with Napoleon. Uh, and uh, declared war in England, and he actually um, started, you know, he actually ordered an army of Cossacks to march on India, uh, and uh, given the sort of the, the, the space involved, uh, by the time Paul was assassinated uh, you know, a couple of years later, you know, the, the, the Cossacks got, you know, as far, they didn't even get to the border of the Russian Empire, this is how big it was. And historians are still like arguing whether it was feasible or not. And, uh, you know, obviously it wouldn't have been an easy thing. And uh, I mean, the odds were very heavily against it. Uh, 
as a mm. kind of a practical matter. Uh, as, as, as we know, Paul didn't reign for very long, so there's it's a whole lot yeah. to say about him, really, sadly. But, mm -hmm. you know, there is, there, in this, as, as, as you know, Alexander did not really seem to want him assassinated, he just wanted him disposed, you know. It seems to me, it's my understanding, but there, there is a conspiracy, and I'm not sure if this is a conspiracy or if it's confirmed that the British were yeah. involved in the assassination attempt of mm -hmm. Paul, or in the assass attempt in the assassination of Paul. So was was there British involvement? Is this, uh, do we know if they were, they were, or is this just a conspiracy? Uh, it seems like uh, that the British ambassador Whitworth, uh, I don't remember his first name, um, that he actually was involved. Uh, we know that his girlfriend was the sister to the aristocratic Zuboff brothers. Remember, one of the Zuboff, Platon Zuboff, was Catherine the Great's last and the one of the most successful lovers. Uh, and so obviously he didn't do well under Paul. Uh, mm -hmm. And so now the Zuboff, the, the, the Zuboffs became kind of one of the driving forces of this plot to remove Paul. But, but listen, the thing here is that it's important to remember, yes, I mean, it was a very short reign, but still it was, you know, what, the 90, end of 96 is when Catherine died, it was 97, 98, 99, uh, 18. So it was like four years and a little and a few months. Um, but it's still kind of enough time to figure out what uh, Paul's policy was. And uh, some people argue it was, you know, it was very coherent and, uh, and a very promising uh, way of doing things. It's just he failed to... Um, he failed to basically gather up enough of a consensus uh, from the get you know cooperation from the right people, uh, because in part you know he grew up in this kind of isolated political environment in his little palace, uh, and basically was unable to just kind of form enough alliances. But but listen, it's it's not true that he was not mad, which is British propaganda pronounced. He was not mad. He was not really stupid. He was not just kind of he was not bad. Uh, I mean, it's true that he had these kind of fits of temper, but listen, all 18th and 19th century rulers did. Uh, it was just kind of part of the ruling style. You know, being a powerful man meant you could let your temper go at your, um, at your, you know, uh, inferiors. Uh, but, but you know, that's going to change soon enough. But, uh, but basically, Paul had a very clear program, and and it's very important that you mentioned in the beginning the succession law. Uh, that was part of that program. So he regularized uh, the sort of a clear line of succession that you know, no longer would depend on basically an accident of like who happened to be in St. Petersburg and in control of the guard. Uh, so there was an automatic line. As soon as one emperor dies, the next one is just kind of presumed. The next in line. As long as it's not a woman. Uh, well, I mean, there, there would be some circumstances under which a woman could inherit, but basically, yeah, I mean, uh, and there would, there would be enough male heirs for the rest of the Roman of dynasty, uh, but in, in, but if men did die out, like at some point, women would be allowed to inherit. Uh, but but there were other. But this would but this the, would kind of become. I mean, we're going to get back to this, of course. And, and Nicholas II, it would become a serious problem in the yeah. in the question of a male succession, as we will see later, of course. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's a it's a very good point because the Roman of succession would never be. I mean, it would be clear who would be next in line, but there would always be some kind of small food during the succession, some kind of crisis. You know, it doesn't have to be an assassination, but like we can, you know, talk through it as we go through this uh, this episode. But, uh, yeah, but you know, the important thing is, so on the one hand, Paul did crack down to some extent on the noble, various aristocratic and noble privileges. He was trying to push the nobles to serve. He even would, uh, would kind of like punish them more severely in certain ways like he would strip away noble privilege and then you know he would punish the nobleman uh whereas under Catherine like if you're exempt from say a beating right a corporal punishment then you're exempt and there's nothing they would do whereas Paul tried to kind of get around and abolish some of the noble uh privileges uh also you know the staple of the Russian kind of society at that time served them you know Paul tried to circumscribe it and limit it um and um you know, it's very, very easy to see that had he remained on the throne, like this would be very much a possibility that Russia would lose served him much sooner. Um, things like, on the one hand, uh, you know, censorship became much stronger under Paul, but religious tolerance was probably at its height, uh, you know, at least until the very, uh, you know, at least before 1905, we should say. Uh, so, so, so he was kind of a mixed bag, really. 
but he definitely was not mad. He had his very clear program. Now, in terms of you ask whether there was a there was a plot, I mean, there clearly was a conspiracy uh, led by you know by uh, aristocrats and nobles and officers in the, of the imperial guard. It is clear that Paul had some sense that this was happening. Uh, he also knew it was not the first time there was a conspiracy against him, uh, and uh, and essentially, I mean, uh, kind of the story is kind of well known of what happened uh, that that. Uh, uh, on the day when the conspirators controlled the guard posts around uh, Paul's palace, and you know they snuck in and murdered him. Um, so, so that's kind of the to make a long story short. Mm. And of course, let's talk about Alexander the First. Which, as we mentioned, the Pyramid in an alliance with Napoleon in under Paul the First. That is, if he had not been assassinated, that it was a possibility for this. But what was Alexander's view when he looked over mm -hmm. and? On, on Napoleon, because he things does change with, of course, as we will talk about in a second, the yes. Battle of Austerlitz and the French yeah. invasion of of Moscow. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not Moscow, yes. but Russia. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the very last thing you said? Um, I directed myself that it was not Moscow, but Russia that he yes, yes Moscow comes later, of course. Absolutely right. So, so absolutely correct that uh, the first thing that Alexander the first would do is, you know, reverse his father's uh, foreign policy course and join Austria and Prussia in their war against uh, Napoleon's empire. Uh, but you know, it would be a couple of years before that happened because obviously Alexander takes over. You know, before the actual war starts because. Uh, um, Alexander uh, seizes the throne in 1801, and uh, he didn't actually get to the battlefield until 1805. So the the couple of things to remember here. So on the one hand, you know, unlike all the 18th century Tsars who had, you know, a bit of a rough time in their younger years, they were all kind of like questions uh, whether they were going to be even reigning emperors, whether somebody was going to kill them. Uh, there will be all kinds of random, sometimes hostile individuals around them. You know, Alexander, you know, he had a pretty decent childhood, really, you know, by the standards of the day. Uh, he was considered to be, you know, a beautiful person. And, and this was the time when, you know, people think that your ability as a ruler uh, or as, you know, an individual or your intelligence, you know, if, if you're good looking, then you're smart and capable, right? Mm -hmm. If somebody is not good looking, then you're not smart and capable. People believed in that very firmly. And so he had this angelic face that, you know, you can look at his portraits uh, and people just kind of tended to adore him. Uh, but but there were sort of a couple of issues here. On the one hand, Paul was, uh, Paul, I'm sorry, Alexander, you know, he was a great actor. It was like his big talent. So in other words, he could, like, if he needed to cry, he would cry. If he needed to laugh, he would laugh. If he needed to flatter, he would flatter. So so he pretty much, his only, like, real ability was this kind of diplomatic talent uh, that, that he would put to good use during the Napoleonic Wars. But in terms of his intellectual capacity, I mean, he had, you know, Cesar La Harp, like, who was a major Enlightenment era uh, reformer, you know, from Switzerland. Uh, originally, it's like he was a major, major figure, so he got a decent education. Now, we're not quite sure, you know, how much of that enlightenment and our wisdom he imbibed, uh, and uh, if he did what he made out of it. So it's like he would, you know, spout out all the sort of fashionable things, but he had no intention, for example, of like surrendering his personal power. So, like any other successful Tsar, you know, he was great at playing off his various advisors against each other and so on and so forth. And, 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 you know, unlike Paul, who would just, like, scream at somebody and send them off to exile, uh, Alexander would cry, and he would just say, oh, I'm so sorry I had to do this. This really hurts me. Then it hurts you. And and then, you know, then he would fire somebody. It's like the difference between, you know, Stalin and Brezhnev, let's mm. put it this way. <laughs> Two diff very different ruling styles. Uh, so So he was this kind of, like, had this projected this image of a really nice guy he you know would go around without guards you know he lived in this palace just on the outskirts of petersburg that anybody couldn't you know walk past and like sneak you know a view of the rooms from the first floor uh kind of reasonably accessible kind of fellow 
Uh, on the other hand, you know, he did get this streak of uh, militarism from Paul. So he knew drill, he loved military parades, he loved uniforms, uh, loved, you know, figuring out like what kind of uh, uh, you know, military policy he was going to have. And so he was kind of itching to try it out on the battlefield. Because, you know, people by that, you know, after you do all these drilling long enough, I think people would actually believe, you know, as Frederick the Great had believed at one point that if you're good at drill, then, you know, you must be good as a general. And uh, and yes, drill was indeed essential at that time, but it was by no means sufficient. We will come back to this, of course, but it seemed he, I don't think that was necessarily the case for Alexander because he would, was told that he was just during the Napoleonic Wars, he, I, I believe in the, under Auschwitz that he was in just in the way that he did he should not command the army because he was just in the way of the real generals, to put it that way. Yeah, so like later on when Napoleon invaded and you know when he was when it was like really, really, really a complicated issue. I think like the his generals did manage to get that point across and uh, we can sort of talk a little bit more about this, but but essentially there was this in Russian sort of military law. There was, and you know, other European countries too. There was this office of, of a commander in chief, who basically was supposed to be like a mini tsar on a battlefield, right? So, in other words, the idea was is that legally speaking, if the tsar appointed a commander in chief, the tsar's sovereignty was essentially limited. You see what I'm saying? Mm. So, like that's what it meant to have a commander in chief. And so, ultimately, when Alexander went to battle against Napoleon first in 1805, it was this kind of like weird situation because General Kutuzov was um, the commander in chief. So, like Alexander couldn't just like order him to do this or that or the other. He was supposed to work through Kutuzov. So, so like that fiction was there, and all they did in eighteen twelve is they actually made it a reality and made Alexander go back to Petersburg. Now let's talk about before the Napoleonic Wars. Of course, he had to get married, and it seems that the marriage began happily, but it would sour eventually, and he wouldn't find a Polish mistress eventually that he had actually a family with that he and a legitimate family with that he actually seemed to love more than his actual wife in the end. Yeah, right. So he, um, I'm trying to remember, like, I think, like, they had some, um, like, children, like, who, like, died in infancy or something like mm -hmm. that. I'm, I don't they actually few, remember yeah. the details, but basically, by, but I don't remember the details of that, but obviously it's clear that um, that Alexander the first, you know, he didn't have any legitimate children who, um, who could succeed him, but, you know, he had a bunch of brothers who all well, not all, but you know, two of them were very busily um, procreating, uh, so that really wasn't really a question for him. But but yes, I mean, it is really kind of a surprising thing, like why uh, Alexander the first. I mean, it was like his first duty is to is to produce an heir, uh, and he absolutely failed to do that. Um, so it's kind of like a big tragic story. I mean, he was not really, as you pointed out, he was not at all averse to no love life, basically. Mm. Uh, but but yes. So, of course, let's talk about the, next, about the biggest thing, and I'm sure you've seen, and I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen the trailer for the new Napoleon movie that's coming out in November, and we see a little bit of what I suppose is Austerlitz, so let's talk about the real Battle of Austerlitz, which is significant in yeah. both Napoleon, Napoleonic history mm -hmm. and, of course, in the Russian history as well. So let's, mm -hmm. talk, so let's talk about the beginning of the Napoleonic invasion mm -hmm. of we mentioned Poland and how it would become important in the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the Battle of Austerlitz for a second. Yes, absolutely. Well, this was obviously one of uh, probably the most famous, probably Napoleon's favorite victory uh, ever, um, since obviously we know he first defeated the Prussians uh, at the Battle of Jena and Auerstedt, and, and then uh, moved in against the Austrians and the Russians. Uh, and uh, I mean, you would think uh, that on the one hand, Napoleon's army was at the height of its ability, right? Uh, Napoleon was still kind of very energetic and healthy, uh, and he had his, uh, basically, his strategic uh, uh, acumen very much uh, with him. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the, potentially speaking, if the Russians, the Prussians, and the Austrians 
have been able to coordinate their efforts, um, you know, work as a coalition. Uh, they had uh, so much uh, more superior resources. Uh, it's just the problem was is that the three, um, you know, the three rulers uh, mistrusted each other as much as they mistrusted Napoleon, and each of them were hoping to basically, uh, uh, you know, win the battle without his allies. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, I mean, this is really kind of beyond the scope of, of this podcast. Uh, but you know, Prussia inherited this army of Frederick the Great, uh, and uh, Russia inherited the army of Catherine the Great, and so on. And the Austrians were also pretty much, you know, a very martial. Uh, sort of martial uh, bunch at that time after you know spending the entire 18th century fighting you know the Ottomans and so on and the and the French and the Prussians so so there is this kind of very um, uh, sort of a lot of expectations basically on all three sides that like we have this legacy we are going to win like there's no way we can lose uh, on the other hand uh, Napoleon obviously revolutionized war uh, revolutionized warfare. Uh, in contrast to the 18th century, where generals would just kind of ballet and dance around each other, try to cut off each other's you know line of communications, and uh, only risk a major battle if you know the odds were heavily in their favor. Uh, in the 19th century, you know, Napoleon's style was to actually actively seek a major battle, uh, and this was very much an anathema for sort of earlier rulers. And uh, Napoleon's style was to just if you destroy the enemy army, then the enemy's country is going to be at your disposal, which was more or less true if you're talking about Austria or, uh, or Prussia, but it would be a little bit of a problem in the, in the Russian Empire, right? So so, so there, there are these very different styles, but the thing is that Russia itself had a, a kind of like a proto-Napoleonic military tradition, and of course I mean uh, Field Marshal Suvorov, uh, who by that time was dead for several years, but you know he had a lot of um, students and followers who also believed in this kind of very active attacking approach. Um, and General Kutuzov, who actually was uh, Kutuzov, K U T U Z O T U Z O V, Kutuzov, uh, who was later the hero of the kind of 1812 of actual of the resistance to the French invasion. So he was already commander in chief, um, and he was one of the favorite uh, students of uh, Suvorov's. But he had a very different style, like he was all into, you know, attacking if necessary, but he was much more into being a chess player and just kind of uh, outmaneuvering and deceiving uh, and kind of fooling the enemy. Um, and we would see that he would do this very masterfully to the Ottomans in 1811, 1812, just before the French invasion. Uh, and he basically did this uh, to the French uh, in 1805. So while he was forced to join the battle uh, with Napoleon, he, because Alexander I ordered him to, um, no, Kutuzov like really didn't want to have anything to do with it because he knew that his army was inferior and it was not be a good idea. However, basically, on the day of battle, Alexander I and the Austrians and uh, their Austrian advisors, they kind of like took over and forced uh, the Russians and the Austrians to march into places where they should not have marched and where Napoleon uh, easily struck them and basically forced, you know, the whole our allied army to flee, right, to make the long story short. So it was one of the most spectacular defeats uh, of uh, Imperial Russian army. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and that was kind of like the end of the hopes for that uh, part of the Napoleonic Wars. However, Kutuzov at that point, you know, once again regained his control of the army, and he was able to very masterfully retreat and get away from harm's way and fight, live to fight another day, basically. And of course, let's talk about the famous meeting between Alexander and Napoleon on the famous boat across yes. the river, which is quite absolutely for this for for them for the invasion of Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. So uh, there, there are there are going to be more and more diplomatic kind of uh, uh, revolutions we can we can call them because uh, after you know after eighteen oh five and the defeat at Austerlitz uh, for a while uh, the first the Prussians then the Austrians kind of like drop out of the game essentially because they don't have an army anymore. However, Alexander the first manages to raise another military force and fights a, a couple of battles in what today is Eastern Prussia uh, against Napoleon. One of them, he kind of uh, is basically a draw, the Battle of Preussisch Eulau, uh, 
uh, and the other battle of the Russia, the Battle of Friedland, the Russians lose very heavily. However, this experience was unpleasant for the French as well, and uh, I think Napoleon could like see that. That's this really. Uh, I mean, he really had to think it through before he moves any further to the east. Uh, and uh, Napoleon decided, well, you know, his actual enemy is uh, Britain and uh, uh, and not so much Russia. And, and Alexander I decides, you know what? I had enough of that kind of warfare, coalition warfare. Uh, and essentially, as you mentioned, um, the Russians and the French French uh, make a peace treaty, and they meet in 1809, um, the Treaty of Tilsit, and Tilsit is a town in eastern Prussia uh, on the river of Niman, uh, which was the border river at that point, uh, between the Russian sphere and the French sphere, uh, and uh, the two emperors meet on a raft in the middle of the Elbe River, and they have, uh, of the Niman River, and they have this like, nice conversation, and then, of course, they have parties, and hunting groups, and balls, and uh, they sort of meet each other as women, and so so they have this kind of a rapprochement, basically. What, and, and, what was Alexander's impression of Napoleon when they met? Uh, well, I mean, I don't quite remember like what the exact detail was, but like I know that uh, you know they, I mean, basically the, the the Russians, including Alexander, I mean, they they didn't actually like respect Napoleon as they peer, you know, as a. I mean that he was an upstart, a usurper, you know, a monster from Corsica. So, for example, uh, when there was a question of whether one, one of uh, Alexander's sisters was it Yelena, I think it was Yelena, uh, Yelena uh, Pavlovna, uh, was going to be married off to Napoleon. Uh, at least that's what Napoleon wanted. You know, like the Russians would have nothing to do with it. So, like he was not really an equal. He, he like, was uh, actually, as according to the biography I read on Alexander recently, mm -hmm. he didn't seem to actually consider this, so then he delayed it, but he delayed it so long yeah. that he ended up divorcing, of course, Josephine, and then he married uh, yeah. Mary Louise of Habsburg. So Absolutely. He, he did delay it. He, it could possibly have happened had he not delayed it so long that he ended yeah. up having a backup, so to mm -hmm. speak, in the Habsburg mm -hmm. dynasty. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, yeah, I mean, so this kind of alliance, you know, it's it's very different from this kind of partnership on the Tsar Paul, where like there weren't really any kind of fingers crossed. Let's put it this way: mm -hmm. this partnership uh, was more, very more, much more similar to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which like was kind of a partnership in some things, but there wasn't really an alliance. Uh, uh, and uh, in a similar vein, uh, the while the Russians, of course. Uh, you know, they, they relieved the pressure on Napoleon from the East and promised to join the continental system, that is the economic blockade uh, of England by the French, uh, but like they never actually did that. And Napoleon had no way to enforce it since of course, uh, uh, Russia had, uh, you know, separate access to the to the sea. Uh, so, so there was really, you know, after the first few months, I would say, like there was really not a question of that there's going to be another war very soon. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's kind of a very famous thing that goes along with Alexander's passion for, you know, mimicry and hypocrisy and acting is that he was very big on spying, and having a very robust intelligence service. And uh, it was said, you know, there were it was quite a network of Russian agents in Paris. And so some people say that uh, Alexander learned about Napoleon's military plans uh, faster than his own generals did. Uh, Another and, important, uh, uh, of course. His prime minister as well in this is Talleyrand, who mm -hmm. informs Alexander kind of betrays yeah. Napoleon and informs Alexander on what Napoleon's plan is next. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right, and so Napoleon's regime is also not exceptionally secure, and there was a very big issue like whether if um, and as you know when while Napoleon was fighting the war in Russia, there was like an attempt to to unseat him in Paris. Um, so the, there was always that danger that that if the French got too stuck in the east, uh, then there were going to be problems and revolts and so on. Um, so 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 it is a kind of a very very uh, kind of strange uh, you know partnership between the Russians and Napoleon, and it was going to go sour very very quickly. However, while it is going on, Alexander would get certain very tangible benefits. Uh, from it. Um, in particular, he was allowed to go after the Ottoman Empire, after Iran, and after Sweden. Uh, 
And so the Russian empire increased considerably because the Russians acquired Finland, which became, used to be a, a Swedish possession. And now of course, it's going to be an autonomous duchy uh, within the Russian empire, but you know, under Russian military control. And then there are two more areas. One is what today's Azerbaijan uh, and parts of Armenia that used to be part of Iran. So now the Russians conquered it. Uh, and also uh, what today is the, the post-Soviet Republic of Moldova, which the Russians also conquered from the Ottomans. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of ironic and uh, not very widely known that the uh, Russian army under general at that point, Kutuzov, basically used the same trick against the Turks that they would later use against Napoleon, meaning basically trap them in a burnt out fortress uh, that the enemy wanted so badly, and now look, it fell to their le to their feet, uh, and it ended up it was just a trap, basically, kind of like doom the enemy effort. And the kind Turkish of a Trojan case, horse in a sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it was a Trojan fortress, so to say. Mm. Uh, so Kutuzov basically tried it out on the on the on the Ottomans first. So so Alexander did get a great deal out of this alliance, really, and also and now, got a chance to prepare, you know, to prepare for the war. So we had years and years to prepare. Now, let's talk about the annexation of Finland for a second, because he doesn't, he never really declares, as far as I understand, he never really declare war, or it's more a surprise war on Sweden, mm -hmm. that he just enters Finland and annexes it without even declaring a formal war on Sweden, mm -hmm. and he just annexes it. But well, from my understanding, again, from my understanding, it they did seem to have a certain amount of freedom in the Russian. They didn't try to, well, yeah. as what they, they would do later in the Russian, in, under Nicholas II, especially, that to Russify yeah. Finland and let the nobility kind of be there. Of course, they would have to answer to Russia, but Finland had their kind of sort of own parliament in a sense. And they did yes, absolutely. have a certain amount of freedom compared to other annexed mm -hmm. Russian territory. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, to be completely honest, I do not remember the sort of the diplomatic background of like this whole issue about declaring war. And uh, even though I really do like uh, sort of military history to to a considerable extent, but uh, I do remember that uh, the sort of war itself was kind of a, involved a rather sudden march uh, against the Gulf of Botnia uh, that sort of created you know, in the middle of the winter that sort of created a lot of problems basically for the Swedish military so 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 it was a um, kind of like a a bit of a how to put it this way it was not a sort of a slow gradual invasion right it was a very much um, kind of like a violent and rapid assault um on the other hand, uh, it, it is true that basically the, the Finnish upper classes that were, of course, mostly Swedish at that point, uh, ethnically speaking, were kind of left alone. Uh, and there was already, of course, a very powerful precedent for that, which is uh, the Baltic German abilities, uh, especially those from what today is Estonia and Latvia, uh, who were, they basically consciously went over to the Russians during the Peter the Great's mm -hmm. Great Northern War. Uh, because let's put it this way, the Swedish over, over overlordship, you know, was not very good at that point. Mm. So, uh, uh, but in terms of the this kind of Finnish uh, Finland's nobility, it was kind of like a very similar deal that there was a very considerable, it was pretty much you know com the legal system, taxation, uh, the military system, or rather the lack thereof. Uh, it was all education, languages. It was all pretty much left intact. Uh, and it is important to know that, like any major empire, but probably even more so, um, you know, Russia had such a diverse uh, sort of selection of various non-Russian possessions um, in basically every di every direction of the globe um, uh, of the compass, uh, and basically there would be different policies uh, towards you know different groups. It was very sort of flexible. Uh, set and and uh, Finland basically probably had it the best deal out of all of these groups, uh, and uh, yes, there would be you know, considerable Finnish nationalism and resistance beginning in the late nineteenth uh, century, and that there would be Russian ways to Russian attempts to kind of um, uh, to to reduce Finnish autonomy, but that's a much later story. Mm. Um, so 
Now, I want to go to Sweden for a few seconds because as we were mentioning before in the Sweden-Norway episode and in the first part there, we're going to mention him again when we cover Napoleon's life very soon. But of course, Baron Duff becomes, who is still the ruling dynasty in Sweden, to become king mm-hmm. of Sweden in, I don't remember the year, but he, and, but he does become king of Sweden, of course, and he... What the Swedish hope is, is that he, with his general experience as a, as a French general, they hope that he will con- reconquer Finland again from Russia, who is, I'm pretty sure is occupied in Napoleon's invasion at this point. But instead, he does diplomatic, make a diplomatic peace alliance with Alexander, and he, of course, gets nor in this alliance, gets Norway as a conversation of the Ruby. And again, we covered this earlier on, which I highly recommend checking out, the Sweden-Norway Union on, on this podcast, but still he gets Norway, Sweden gets Norway for the next 90, mm-hmm. 1995 years in, until 1905, until our independence in, in 1905. But he does see peace and he's quite a skilled diplomat, well, not far enough, but let's talk. So, you know, he... It does the war with Sweden does not really, it's not really an issue for Alexander, but this is a lot. This is of course a long story short. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think that there's sort of a couple of things that we can uh, pull out of this, yeah. and uh, uh, one is that uh, yeah, so Alexander as the diplomat, uh, and but also like the nature of diplomacy at that time, where um, major states were constantly switching alliances, uh, the way you know later on. It would be, you know, pretty unthinkable, right? So if we're talking about, uh, I don't know, the Second World War or the Cold War, like, yes, you had certain diplomatic upsetting kind of events, but like not not of this kind where basically major, major European nations would be like doing this every few years. Uh, and Alexander I, like he really knew how to play this diplomatic um, sort of system. Uh, and uh, he didn't manage to basically pull Sweden over to his side. You know, he also managed to um, to basically s- strengthen his relationship with Britain. Got a lot of subsidies, uh, money, even like weapons shipped uh, to Russia, like rifles. Uh, and uh, but 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 also in general, um, if you look at strategy and how military force and geography kind of intersects in that part of the world. Uh, you know, for Russia, the, one of the biggest security issues would be uh, uh, would be this kind of like barrier of states, uh, each of which would not be by itself powerful enough to you know damage Russia very heavily. But if you if you know two or more of them gang together, that would be a real danger, especially if they would be sponsored by a major you know Western you know, European power, and so. You had the three great Eastern European kind of threats, uh, which would be Sweden, Poland, and the Ottoman Empire that the Russians had to deal with. Uh, and probably Alexander the first biggest nightmare would be if the three of them would actually join Napoleon uh, in war against Russia, right? And and so it would, was a big success of uh, Alexander the first and his his generals that the Ottoman Empire and Sweden were out of the picture. Um, you know, by by the time the French started another war, uh, and Poland, of course, had been by that time. Well, first it was divided, and then uh, after Napoleon defeated Prussia in uh, eighteen o seven, he formed the so called Grand Duchy of Warsaw, uh, that was basically just a few central Polish core provinces organized as like a dependency to Napoleon. And yes, like they would, uh, the Poles would fight against the Russians in eighteen twelve, but you know, it was uh, much less damaging than if the entire Polish kingdom had invaded, to put it that way. No, of course, you have to move on. I'm, I'm afraid I yeah. we don't have time to talk about everything, unfortunately. But, I'm, of course, I will be covering more of this in detail later. But yeah. let's talk about Napoleon's second invasion of Russia and mm-hmm. the burning of Moscow and the score, yeah. how we use score mm-hmm. uh, to you know, try to stop Napoleon's forces from mm-hmm. coming in Russia and invading Russia. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I mean, there's kind of like two, three uh, points and stop me when, when it gets too much. But uh, uh, one thing to remember, it was not just Napoleon who invaded. It was pretty much, you know, it was most of Europe, mm-hmm. essentially. And um, Napoleon's army was, 
you know, very large proportion of it was you know, various German uh, troops, the Germans, the Italians, the Dutch. Um, then there were the Prussians and Austrians by that time were allied with Napoleon. Uh, and, you know, they were kind of a threat, but did not take an active part in the invasion. So basically, like most of Europe, anybody with a significant military force other than the British took part in that invasion. Uh, and uh, the Russians were just very severely outnumbered uh, in the beginning of the invasion, at least. Uh, so so that was a big minus. Uh, and uh, Napoleon's best bet was to would be to trap and destroy the Russian army somewhere close to the border. Basically, essentially what Hitler would have attempted, would attempt and fail in 1941 later on. Basically, you have to trap the Russians before they have time to kind of get out of the way. Uh, or bring up reinforcements in the Soviet case. Uh, so, so Napoleon wanted to just jump the Russians and destroy them. Uh, and uh, the, the the Russians at first, they actually wanted to offer a battle and uh, fight Napoleon right there on the border. Uh, but when they realized just how much bigger uh, the French army is, uh, they basically said, okay, we're going to pull back a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. Mm. So and the this, point is that as, and this is if I remember correctly, this frustrated the French. Sorry, not the, the French, but the Russian generals who felt, felt that it was cowardice mm -hmm. to just retreat after retreat. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so in other words, like the the point is that when they talked about using the, using the so called Scythian tactics, it's from ancient history, um, meaning retreating, destroying, burning the supplies as you retreat. You know, I like, guess they were talking about it, but for them, you no, know, th this did not mean retreating to Moscow, right? Mm. So, like, this was never really what they contemplated. They thought, you know, they would retreat, I don't know, a hundred miles and then give battle to Napoleon and, and you know, destroy his army. Um, especially because, uh, look, like, when we think about uh, Napoleon, Napoleonic era warfare, you know, where like soldiers marched on foot in really uncomfortable shoes. And you know, they dragged really heavy rifles and really heavy mm -hmm. supplies. And basically, like, the first thing they did when they got tired, they would, like, drop everything they could, right? Uh, warm clothes, extra food. And then, like, you know, basically, as we know from historical materials from that time, then a soldier would just get tired and could not march anymore. Then you would just sit down somewhere by the roadside and just not walk anymore. And so... What happened time and again, you have a hundred thousand soldiers marching in, and then you know, a couple of weeks later, it's just you know, 50,000 soldiers because the rest are just kind of tired somewhere in the back, or they're sick, or their shoes don't work anymore. Uh, and that's essentially what was going to happen to Napoleon. He had to leave little garrisons everywhere he went, and his soldiers got tired and sick, and uh, or, or killed, or dead from disease. And yes, I believe mean, this century was a big problem as well during the. Napoleonic invasion of Russia. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be a big, big problem, right? So so Napoleon moves in and the Russians fall back and they fight a few kind of battles to delay them. But basically, there's really still his forces are so much bigger than... Uh, and Napoleon is so talented in terms of just finding the vulnerable spot and kind of like intercepting the Russians at the right moment that like, basically there was no option but to retreat more and more and more until just outside of Moscow where uh, the Russians stood uh, and gave battle, uh, what was, uh, as is well known, the bloodiest battle of Napoleon's uh, career, uh, which was essentially a tactical draw. Uh, operationally speaking, was clearly a victory for the French, uh, since they captured Moscow soon afterwards. However, strategically, it was clearly a big defeat for Napoleon, because there was only one way in which he could have won the war, that would be if he managed to eliminate the core of the Russian army, right? So we're talking about like there are all these stragglers and all the weaklings, uh, all the soldiers who fall off by the web by the wayside. But there's a core of you know people who know what they're doing, right? Who are kind of always at the ranks. They're always there. They're still alive a few months later. And if Napoleon would have managed to eliminate that core, then basically there was no way the Russians would have raised another army to resist him, okay? and they couldn't do anything they wanted to. So Napoleon failed to do that. Instead, Kutuzov's army retreated. You know, it suffered horrendous losses, but you know, it retreated in reasonably good order. And yes, indeed, Napoleon marched into Moscow. Uh, there's a whole big story about like why it burned. You know, there's still not a clear agreement of who started it. Uh, it's clear that you know an abandoned 
city made of wood with lots of alcohol uh, and a lot of uh, soldiers who were tired and stressed out, like it was kind of doomed to burn. So I think, uh, you know, I think Tolstoy is right uh, in that term. Uh, however, it also true is it's also true that the Russian authorities removed all the firefighting equipment. Uh, and that didn't help, right? But but that's also a little bit misleading because like, come on, you don't need firefighting equipment. You just need you know a few axes and mm. you know a, a you know like there are a lot of tools running around to break down burning houses. So but so, so it's kind been, of a... would, would there been any different if he had marched on Saint Petersburg instead of Moscow? Do you think that would change the outcome of the war, or would it have just been the same story? So uh, uh, one detachment of the French army did attempt to march uh, to Petersburg and it failed, it was stopped in Belarus. Um, so that depends, you know, whether the, uh, Russia, the Russian army had been eliminated. And the answer is that if Napoleon destroyed the Russian army, the core of the Russian army, the Imperial Guard, the old soldiers, experienced officers, if they all ended up dispersed or killed, then it doesn't matter where he would march because like he would really have his options open. Yeah, sure he could march to Petersburg, but again, if you even if you look today at like look at Google Maps and you would see how Petersburg is surrounded by most horrendous swamps and forests, and it would be you know highly you know problematic idea. Uh, but but not impossible, right? Now, however, if the Russian army had survived, it wouldn't really help to march to Petersburg because uh, Napoleon would have been cut off from his supplies even faster. It would have been an even quicker uh, end for him. Um, so now, while in Moscow, and he was there for about what, something like six weeks, uh, Napoleon offers a peace treaty to Alexander, and Alexander famously turns it down, and he does it several times. Uh, and uh, the sort of the, the next sort of quick point of how it all ended, because obviously we have probably have to move to other other subjects, is mm -hmm. that you you know we, we all obviously have seen pictures of this kind of like freezing French soldiers marching through this kind of snow waste of Russia, and we get this kind of myth of you know General Winter that defeats mm -hmm. the invader, and you know then later on beaten Nazi generals. Uh, would be talking about it and you know it's obviously that kind of image comes up again and again and again when somebody tries to fight a war in that part of the world and mm -hmm. is not prepared is not properly prepared for it but but the point is that you know at first napoleon didn't want to just leave russia he wanted to um you know he wanted to just kind of pull back from moscow and get himself another base and uh, try again next year that's what he wanted to do However, he was outmaneuvered by the Russians uh, and he failed to find a supply that was still a base that was still intact. And he found himself moving sort of like the way or the Russians were retreating early and now Napoleon is retreating, you know, a few more miles, a few more miles, a few more miles until he, you know, ended up basically without the, on the army. The point is that the weather was unusually mild that year. And uh, if we sort of look at the famous image of the French army crossing the Berezina River in Belarus, the, the border river. Uh, there's a kind of like, think about it, the, the, the French had to build bridges, right? Uh, and uh, because they, they didn't want to swim across icy water. The question mm. is like, why did they have to build bridges? Why didn't they just cross over ice, right? Mm. Because that's how people crossed rivers in that part of the world, over ice. But there was no ice because the weather was really warm. Right. And so the and but but, you know, it kind of kept changing like back and forth. But like it was not just so horrendously terrible that the French just were doomed to die of cold exposure. Um, so but but as it as it happened, you know, once your food runs out, you choose the wrong route to retreat. Uh, just to gradually soldiers, your men just get tired and the bigger, stronger men get tired first. And we know that from. Uh, the Battle of Stalingrad, for example, in 1942, the healthier you are in uh, in normal life, the, 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 the sooner that person is going to die of exposure and you know, malnutrition and illnesses. And to this day, archaeologists find these like graveyards and like Lithuania and Belarus and Eastern Poland or basically Napoleonic soldiers who would just sit down in a frozen field somewhere and just never get up. And nobody would even know they're there. So, like, the mortality was really, really quite horrendous. But it really, to say that it was a general winter um, that defeated Napoleon, it's kind of to miss the point. Uh, and when the point is that, like, 
you know, I mean, of course, weather didn't really help. It's, it's anybody who goes to Russia or Ukraine or Belarus today, like you can sort of get a sense that like the weather is kind of rough, right? On the other hand, the reason why Napoleon failed was he was, you know, out strategized um, by the Russian generals. Before we move on to Nicholas II, I want to talk about Alexander's in March to Paris and the Napoleonic retreat, of course, which is, and um, I would want to bring this up now because you have a famous saying from Second World War when Stalin entered Berlin, or not, his troops did, and he got the call from Churchill where he says, congratulations, but he just says, well, Alexander got Paris. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, well, uh, diplomatically speaking, this probably was probably the high point of uh, uh, of you know, Russia as a great European power, um, in a sense. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, again, to put it in a couple of sentences, so first of all, some people argue whether the Russians should have even crossed into Europe and basically finished Napoleon off or just had some kind of treaty and uh, be done with it. And then and that's a kind of a big, big issue here. Uh, for a number of reasons, Alexander I uh, realized that Napoleon was never going to give him peace as long as he was in power. Uh, and so he basically made a decision to basically cross over and start another major coalition. The second point is that it was not at all predetermined that Prussia and Austria would actually go over to the Russians again, you know, risk everything again. Uh, because there was a serious danger that Napoleon would raise another army and would crush all the Austrians and the Prussians one more time. So, uh, and it was really a tribute to Alexander's diplomatic abilities. So he was uh, able to talk his counterparts, you know, the Austrians and the Prussians, talk them into joining forces. And his biggest achievement was to actually coordinate to make sure that you know the emperor, the emperor and the king, you know they didn't get on on the general's way, right? And um, and sort of that that allies marched where they were supposed to march. That was a big deal. So on the other hand, Napoleon did raise another major army. It was not quite the same though, right? Because sort mm -hmm. of the yeah, I mean his imperial guard, you know, mostly made it out of Russia, but nobody else did. Right? Pretty much nobody else came out in one piece. And so this core. You know, this core. The elites were untrained soldiers. They didn't have the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want the one army, the Grand Army of that march in mm -hmm. Russia had? Mm -hmm. And I think that always happens uh, in these kind of uh, massive, almost industrial scale wars is that mm -hmm. the able, the able and the brave and the, uh, and uh, the loyal and dedicated ones, you know, they die right away, basically. And, uh, and that's what you know happened to the French, and you know it's happened even before they they got into Moscow. That happened at Borodino, and so now, like yes, Napoleon raises another big army, but his German allies are no longer reliable, uh, and the French recruits, you know, basically he's running out of soldiers, uh, and so it was um, almost like what Americans call techno war. Uh, so it was a question of just numbers and uh, not making any major mistakes. Now, now to be completely fair, Napoleon won a couple of major battles uh, in 1813. Uh, however, you know, he you know lost uh, the Battle of Leipzig, uh, Battle of Nations, and uh, as we know, uh, Napoleon was still functioning, um, you know, in 1814 in Paris. Uh, he did some spectacular maneuvers, uh, just showed his like last show of brilliance basically but uh, uh the russians and their allies uh, just had such superior forces there was really not very much that could be done at that point you mentioned the battle of leipzig and if you ever are in leipzig which i haven't recommended visiting which because it has quite a lot of history you should absolutely go see the napoleonic monuments that stands there not was built mm -hmm. began built after the second world war with which it took actually a hundred years i believe to build this monument and it's was used in, during the Nazi rallies in the, in the under the Third Reich, and it was uh, it still yeah. stands today. So it's absolutely worth checking out the Napoleon the, yep. the monument that it has. Mm -hmm. It has its own history, in it, so, so to speak. So it's worth checking out if you ever absolutely. are in Leipzig. Mm -hmm. I will. I will be sure to do that. Uh, and yes, I mean absolutely. There was a lot of mythology. 
uh, and by mythology, I don't mean it was false. I just mean it's, you know, set up ideological heroic narratives uh, that were really important for uh, German nationalism and German national unification later on, of course. Hmm. Now, of course, we have to move on because I'm, I'm afraid yeah. to talk quite a lot, a lot about Alexander first, but his brother, as you know, we talked about he had really no heir, only illegitimate children who, of course, was was no way they were going to take over the mm-hmm. throne. So as you mentioned earlier in this episode, we his brother Nicholas the first take over. And what I find and of course in in this one the Crimean War will become essential of course for his history. But let's talk about how his early rule and I want to add this that of course this is the, at this point he's the one that coined the term for the Ottoman Empire that they really were the sick map of Europe. He is the one that Nicholas the first was the person to coin this, but let's begin with his early rule and what led up to the, the Crimean War, which I believe he is most known for. Yeah, so we'll, um, you know, just stop me when it gets into, uh, yeah. I don't like too much detail because we do want to get to the Crimean War. Uh, I mean, it is a pretty sort of big chunk of uh, of history. Um, now, Nikolai the uh, first, Nicholas, uh, he is, I don't remember how much younger, but like he's, uh, it's a two digit number of years, basically. He's from a, a different generation. I think he was born in like 1796 or something like that. Uh, and, I think Ale- that. and I think Alexander the first was born in like what 1778 or something like this. I might be wrong, but but there's a big difference in age. And so uh, Alexander is more like a father figure rather than an oldest sibling in that way. Uh, not the, the key thing to remember is that again, recall that all stars, but especially Alexander the first are very kind of jealous of their power and they don't want to like train their heir too soon. Okay. And mm-hmm. so Nikolai the first, um, well, I mean, first of all, he's not, I mean, originally he was not even the official heir, right? So originally Alexander's other brother, Constantine, was supposed to be the heir. But he wasn't uh, really and, interested in becoming an heir, as far as I understand. I, he would, well, it's it's kind of questionable. Uh, but he also he did a, a marriage which would allow yeah. him this 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 allowed him from the throne. That yeah, made him, made exactly. Him so it was known him. as a it was known as the morganatic marriage. To, he was married to a Polish noblewoman, uh, and morganatic marriage basically means that it has like no dynastic significance, and the children don't have any rights or inheritance, mm. uh, officially speaking. Uh, but but the thing is that like until eighteen twenty five, until Alexander the first dies, everybody thinks that Constantine will be the Tsar. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, you know, secretly speaking, uh, the arrangement is made that Constantine would give up his powers to Nicholas, and Nicholas is kind of being secretly groomed a little bit, but mostly informally as the sort of the next ruler. But but look, Nick, Constantine had the same education, the same enlightenment, broad, potentially you know, helpful education that Alexander. Nicholas is from a different generation, and he is gotten a much simpler upbringing it's mostly you know military drill you know calligraphy you know like building forts and things like mm-hmm. that um i mean he had a pretty decent like math education and so on and he was like a decent military engineer even but like none of that was enough to really to sort of run a vast empire with a vast army let's put it this way and so nicholas was very you know reasonably competent as a like a division commander you know but like this is not enough again to run an empire uh, and uh, Alexander kind of intentionally to kept the younger Grand Dukes, Nikolai and Mikhail, sort of out of any kind of um, important issues, let's put it this way. And so by the end, Alexander I died in 1825, which is, of course, what, like 13 years after the war against Napoleon. You know, Alexander became you know, more mystically inclined, more religious, because he thinks, you know, it was God's direct intervention that saved him from Napoleon. Uh, so he it's not that he gives up on the Enlightenment, it's just he gets attracted to its more conservative side, to put it that way. Um, is again interested in religion, mysticism, you know, he's kind of frightened that, the, he's afraid that there's a Jacobin conspiracy in Russia that might remove him from the throne as well, as, you know, his father had been removed. So Alexander is kind of like really... Um, 
I don't want to say paranoid because I'm not a psychiatrist, but like he's doesn't want to empower other Grand Dukes. Uh, and so as a result, we have a major succession crisis uh, that was accompanied by uh, a military uprising known as the December's Revolt that happened in December 1825. Uh, and uh, it was basically, you know, there, there were there were some groups uh, of conspiracy of conspirators in the Russian Empire. You know, almost as soon as you know, as the Russians marched into France uh, in 1814. Uh, so there were these, and, and you know, these kind of people existed all over Europe at that time. Basically, some of them, it, you know, were just so used to this kind of military life and you know, of risking your life and danger that they just wanted to continue it. And others, you know, have read, you know, too much Enlightenment era texts and wanted, and, and you know, they thought that Alexander the First should like follow through with additional reforms, and you know, we can't really talk about this too much right now. Uh, and so, so there's a there's a kind of a political agenda, and the most radical of those future Decemberist uh, mutineers, you know, with this guy Colonel uh, Pestel, uh, P S T E L, he was just a kind of a proto Napoleon, basically. Had he succeeded, it would have been basically a Russian Napoleon. Uh, and the rest of them came in all kinds of um, uh, basically political uh, backgrounds. Some were more radical than others, uh, but a remarkable number of these conspirators had a secret services experience. So so like involved as spies of various kinds of agents. Like one of the major one, I'm I think, trying to remember which one, I think it was the Volkonsky like his responsibility was when you know when Napoleon captured Paris during the Hundred Days in 1815, his responsibility was to get out Russian officers who were like stuck there and couldn't get out. Like his responsibility was like secretly get them out. So there were all kinds of secret missions. Even Pestel had major secret service experience in the Balkans. Uh, so these guys knew what they were doing. To put it this way, however, uh, during the succession crisis, a few of them managed to basically persuade. Um, some of the soldiers of the Imperial Guard, but not the majority, that look, Nicholas, the Grand Duke, was usurping, you know, illegally taking the throne that rightfully belongs to Constantine, uh, and uh, managed to basically get them out. And the plot was basically to uh, uh, get in front of the Senate, and the Senate was this kind of governing body, right, uh, uh, to kind of advisors to the Tsar, in a sense. Um, yeah, they were not lawmakers or anything like that. They were just mostly kind of an advising body. But the point was that in the absence of a legitimate Tsar, they were kind of like the next place to go. The point was to force the Senate to recognize that Constantine was the rightful emperor. Uh, however, uh, Nikolai and the people who were loyal to him kind of outplayed the rebels uh, and basically got there first, essentially. Uh, but the, the point is, though, um, unlike what you might read in most history books, it was a very dicey moment. Like, it was very, very possible. It did not either... end this way, necessarily. No, no, not at all. I think it was very possible. Uh, it mostly depended, you know, on the Decembers having their act together a little bit better. Um, but, uh, you know, there were many, many factors. We can't really go into this. But... There, there, there were all kinds of possibilities, and it was very reasonable that uh, Nicholas may have been forced to be just killed very easily or just forced to abdicate, uh, or maybe the monarchy could have been abolished altogether. It would not have been impossible at all. But as it happens, uh, Nicholas all of a sudden is stuck with the throne uh, very, very suddenly, very uh, unexpectedly. He doesn't really know what he's doing, but... Um, he was a very conscientious ruler. He has this reputation of being this arch conservative, even a reactionary, mostly relying on on terror, fear, you know, secret police, just kind of like beating people into submission. Uh, and uh, it's really, you know, somewhat misleading because, I mean, yes, I mean, he did project this kind of image of uh, you know, a stern foe of you know all revolutionaries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he very much projected uh, this kind of like family scenario, uh, where, which was part of this consensus throughout Europe after Napoleon's end that, look, all these men who took part in revolutionary events now lost their say in political matters. However, they were compensated by improved rights of private property and control over, you know, over women, over children, over their servants and so on. And so the same consensus in Russia as well. So 
Nikolai or Nicholas, you know, he is now firmly in charge, right? But he's more like a father uh, to his subjects, which meant like, yes, he's going to punish them and then punish them and punish them. But also like he was very responsible. He had certain duties um, to perform. And on the other hand, individual, you know, nobles and, you know, wealthy merchants, sort of the property elite, they were also given a great deal of power at that time because look people did not believe in a large government at that point right so like they had the secret police uh, that would catch the revolutionaries on the other hand basically everybody else was left alone to run things as they wanted now i want sorry for jumping ahead a little bit now but i want to ask about this because as you know in the year 1848 it would be quite a turbulent year in europe with the 1848 revolutions and yeah. of course, this never happened in Russia, but did, did Nicholas fear that it, the revolution would come to Russia as well, that there would be yeah. an 1848-49 revolution in Russia too? Oh, absolutely. And there was a big concern. And you know how I know, I mean, not only there's literature about it, but I've worked a fair amount with the documents of Tsarist secret police, you know, from that era. And I was looking for other things, but it's very, very clear that like, most of the time, the, these kind of agents, you know, they were involved in all kinds of things. They were looking for gamblers and, uh, you know, various criminals of various kinds and people who were publishing the things they weren't supposed to publish. And then in 1848, they were just interested in one thing, which was the revolutionaries who were coming over to Russia. And remember, by that time, there were a lot of Polish exiles uh, who had emigrated from Russia uh, in 1830-31. You do have the Weaver movement in, on the border of Poland, in, I believe, as well. That was so, very close to the Russian border at the time. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and so like there were a lot, actually a lot of Polish revolutionaries who tried to try to come into the Russian Empire and start an uprising, but they failed. Uh, and uh, but, but, you know, it was not clear that this was going to fail. Uh, moreover, in St. Petersburg, um, like again, it's a, there's a little bit of a myth that basically all kind of free thinking was suppressed under Nicholas. Actually, Petersburg was full of all kinds of illegal circles under uh, Nicholas, and they were more or less left alone, right? Uh, only one of those circles attracted the attention uh, of authorities, uh, the Petrashevsky circle, of which famously Fyodor Dostoevsky, the future great writer, was a member. Uh, and the Petrashevsky circle, circle circle was suppressed very severely and members were given very harsh sentences. But that was not so much because, you know, the authorities were afraid of them. It's just there was an intrigue between different secret policemen who basically were trying to kind of make careers for themselves. But basically, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a very unstable time. And so we don't want to think that like Russia avoided a major uprising uh, just because it was a stable Russia. But you know, it was pretty dicey. Uh, but as you, I think, probably want to mention, the Russians did invade uh, Hungary, right, to mm. suppress the Hungarian Revolution. Mm. So, of course, the next big thing I think we should talk about is, of course, the Crimean War, which is so complex. That it is my own standard. Historians yeah. always try to avoid this topic because it's so complex. But we have to talk, it is inevitable, of course, when we talk about the Nicholas the first and the Romanov dynasty as a whole, but and I want to mention this as well before we start because there I read a book about British rebellion in in sorry rebellion in the British Empire a while ago, and it is mentioned how when the Crimean War started that there is what I don't remember the tribe but there was some people in South Africa who was hoping Russia would win the Crimean War and come and liberate them in South Africa after they won the war from the British. So it kind of says huh. the extent of how the people are hoped and how important the Crimean War is in not just in European history or Russian history, but as a whole in in this time. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's absolutely. Well, there's really a lot to tell here, uh, to talk about, and I'll let you guide me in kind of specific uh, sort of issues, but in response to your general point, I mean, yes, the Crimean War had a major influence on this kind of diplomatic alignment in Europe and was a direct cause of what's later is going to happen in 1914. Uh, and uh, and probably sort of the biggest, the biggest sort of factor. Sorry, you said 1814, you mean? The First World no, War. Uh, you mean 1914, you said 1814. 
oh shoot i'm so sorry about that <laughs> that's I meant, fine i meant the first world war so so and the, the reason being is that uh the russian empire and the austrian empire were uh traditionally allies for you know for centuries at that point um and this is going to end after the crimean war because even though open warfare was as we know between the Russians and between the coalition of the Ottoman Empire, France, Britain, and the Kingdom of Sardinia, which was of course essential, uh, but but basically the, um, but but this is only like really tells you part of the story because the uh, Austria and Prussia were major factors in the sense that had the war gone uh, you know, worse for the Russians, it is very clear that the Austrians and the Prussians may have easily gotten involved uh, and especially the the issue was that the austrian neutrality was very sort of indisposed very badly disposed toward the russians and uh, nicholas the first and you know later his son alexander the second they viewed the austrian um reaction as basically ingratitude basically a betrayal of sorts because they were like look you know you almost went under in 1848-49 and we saved you by invading Hungary and stopping the revolution, and you know, in retrospect, it may have been, you know, for the Rush from the Russian perspective, it may have been a better solution to just let the Austrian Empire disintegrate. But uh, as it is, it did, and so now the Austrian Emperor, ungrateful as he was, uh, basically threatened to strike the Russians in the back. And so Nicholas the uh, First, he had a very good army, actually. You know, there were, you know, some issues in that. Uh, there were certain modern rifles that the Russians adopted, you know, not as fast as the English and the French, but basically Nicholas's army was excellent, uh, like was in very good order. You know, it was large, it was, you know, well supplied, well trained, uh, but the, the the good part of it was kept on the border with uh, Prussia and Austria in case they decide to do something. Um, now, the troops that actually fought the Crimean War, you know, they were not, the, I mean, the sailors were good, but they were not really sailors in the Black Sea, you know, they were not exactly trained for land warfare uh, and served, you know, mostly as artillery crews um, and the actual soldiers, you know, they were, you know, it's like with wars and we actually, you know, we see this with a, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, when uh, we see troops that were just kind of highly praised before the war, like, you know, on the Russian side, this is the Spetsnaz or the paratroopers. On the Ukrainian side, these are NATO state, NATO trained troops. And then they actually get into battle and they're like, woof, and nothing happens, right? Mm -hmm. And the similar thing happened in the Crimean War, too. Uh, there was just no way to predict whether the troops that were defending Sevastopol, like, they did well, you know, in peacetime, but like, when it actually comes to showing initiative, and uh, as Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy, who took part in the war, noticed, uh, you know, it was a very different question of like how you're going to perform an actual battle. Um, so we can sort of, but but just tell me what your next question is, because you know I can talk about this for mm. several days probably. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's no secret that both France, I believe France and Britain as well, and I believe this is the first time we see them as allies you know, when they've been enemies for several hundred years. And what what was the, their interest in protecting the Ottoman Empire? And of course, my second question is: Would would there have been a chance that if the British and the French and other powers had not intervened against Russia, that Russia could have won? The Crimean War, if the if the other great powers are not interfered. Oh, you mean if, you mean if Britain and France did not intervene? If they had not, would there have been a chance that oh. they have won? And what what was their interest in perce perceiving mm -hmm. the Ottoman Empire, preserving mm -hmm. the Ottoman Empire? Uh, okay, well, I mean, I would recommend this this book uh, by uh, I guess these days he writes more popular histories. Uh, British historian Orlando Figes, and he has this book on the Crimean War. Then you know some of its arguments uh, are kind of a little bit of questionable about the role of religion, for example. But he does show it very nicely how in Great Britain, you know, there had been a certain interest in uh, this kind of that part of the world developing almost as soon as the Napoleonic Wars ended. Uh, and at first, it was just you know kind of a group of ideologues who were you know basically viewed as crazy people back home. Uh, but eventually, you know, they 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 sort of got, uh, you know, to direct the policy essentially. Uh, and uh, you are absolutely correct uh, that uh, it was really 
very difficult to believe to anyone at the moment at that time that uh, the British would have ever allied with somebody called Napoleon, right? Napoleon mm. III at that point, right? I mean, it's just pretty much uh, uh, it's very difficult. It's sort of like imagine, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, very, very much unthinkable. Um, however, so there, there was this kind of interest in uh, uh, basically boosting up the Ottoman Empire and protecting British investments there. Uh, and on the French side as well, there was this kind of growing uh, connection to the Near East. And as we'll know, that France would eventually even colonize Syria and Lebanon. Uh, definitely had a big presence there. Uh, and Napoleon III, you know, he has these like several ideas. One is to boost his um, you know, imperial standing uh, by penetrating the Near East. Um, and the second uh, is, of course, uh, getting even with the Russians. Uh, and basically boosting his influence back home. Uh, it is important to remember that uh, if we think about this kind of British-French alliance in terms of like World War I or World War II, and like this is not how uh, those earlier coalitions worked. So in other words, like they were sort of fighting together, but they were not fighting together, let's put it this way. Like each, they were those sort of reluctant temporary allies um, they were just together for the time being, uh, ready to pull, pull out at the slightest notice. Uh, they were really not cooperating very well while they were at Crimea, when essentially, you know, the French did, you know, most of the fighting, basically, uh, in terms of just kind of the bloodiest, sort of worst parts of it. You know, the British did okay, too, but nothing compared to the French. And then, obviously, as soon as Sevastopol was captured, and more about that in a moment, uh, basically, the French decided that like, we've had enough, and, and essentially forced, um, you know, forced a, a peace treaty that was very generous to the Russians. Uh, and in fact, as early as 1859, just three years after the Crimean War, the French and the Russians, you know, they start a diplomatic kind of uh, you know approach approachment, and uh, they would be you know partners again um, for afterwards. Uh, right. So, 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 in other words, it was very much, you know, it was an alliance, but like you don't want to make too much out of it. But it was a humiliating defeat for Russia, the, the Crimean War, that the Allied power in the third to try to preserve mm -hmm. the Ottoman Empire, empire yeah, at the I mean, time. I mean, it was pretty humiliating. It's remember, it's remember though that uh, the Russian objective was not to destroy the Ottoman Empire, and that's mm -hmm. kind of a I mean, it's a common misconception uh, because, you know, later on, the Russians wouldn't have minded doing that. Uh, Nicholas I wanted a weak Ottoman Empire that would be a buffer, a buffer state. And that's kind of what he was doing in 1830s and 40s. I mean, there was at one point even a Russian fleet stationed in Constantinople uh, to basically save the Sultan from various rebels, from Egyptian rebels, for example. So basically, no, like he didn't want to destroy the Ottomans. Uh, uh, but he definitely, you know, wanted to uh, to have you know more influence. He, want, he wanted uh, to pinch them down a notch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did absolutely. Uh, and uh, the defeat, you know, was quite humiliating because, as I said, you know, Nicholas had a very well put together army, uh, and uh, really, you know, it's it's you know, obviously, many many questions why it wasn't able to do more. Um, one is being that you no, know, most of that army had to be stationed elsewhere. Uh, another is is that you know warfare was changing, and there were certain technological factors, and, and it wasn't just you know uh, uh, rifled uh, rifled uh, muskets uh, and the new artillery, which you know he did have by the way, but it was you know things like steamships, for example. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it's ironic, but I find the argument by a Marxist Soviet historian mm. to be most persuasive there, because uh, look, honestly, the, the 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 war was a draw. Let's put it this way: anywhere but Crimea, uh, the the Russians, you know, fought the Allies off in the Pacific and the White Sea, in the Caucasus, uh, the Turks were defeated big time uh, and captured a major fortress. The Russians captured the fortress of Kars. Which they then exchanged for Sevastopol, which is why the Russians, you know, hadn't suffered any losses in Crimea. Uh, so, but in Crimea itself, yes, the Allies, you know, they managed to capture Sevastopol, but it wasn't even much of a fortress; it was a you no know, bunch of sandbags. And so, from the Russian perspective, uh, like yes, it wasn't a, a great thing that happened, but it was actually, you know, it was kind of invigorating in some ways because they were like, look. 
you know, we fought to a standstill uh, the two hugest military and economic powers on the planet uh, who only captured like a couple of square miles of sandbags that were completely leveled by that time. And moreover, the Russian army, you know, retreated from Sevastopol across that bridge that they had there. So there's a good argument that some historians have made that it's like, it really, the sort of the reforms that we're going to talk about in a moment, they didn't really follow because the Russians were like thinking, oh no, we lost the war. So now we have to do something before we lose it again. Uh, it rather, it was like, you know, imagine like today, if the Russia, if the Russians had to like openly fight, say the American army and the Chinese army, if you would like join forces against something unthinkable right mm. today, imagine if they decided to join forces and like invade some part of Russia, like imagine how long that would war would last. Mm. Uh, and now in the 19th century, the, the Russians, you know, it's not like they were going to, uh, you know, land in Paris anytime soon, but they could have potentially have destroyed the allied landing had they been a little bit better strategically. Uh, but as it was, uh, the thinking was like, look, we almost fought these guys, we, we fought these people to stand still. And so something we're doing must be right. So all we have to do is tinker a little bit with what we have, and we're going to be even more powerful next time. Hmm. So, and, so I hope that. Yeah. So as, as I mentioned early on in the reign, early reign of Nicholas I, we began talking about the that Of course, he is the one that probably most, what most people think about it. And I believe this is a misconception as well for the Ottomans that he coined them as the sick man, the sick man of Europe. Mm -hmm. When when did it come up with, with this term that they were the oh this this really are the sick man of Europe? Mm -hmm. That became well, I mean, more that, famous term. It, it's one of those like pieces of historical trivia that uh, I mean I would have to remember the exact year, but like you know it was on the it was before the Crimean War. Uh, so and and it was a quote. Um, I think it was a was it like a letter that Nicholas the First sent uh to the British government or something like that. But I mean, it's but easy it caught to on. It really it's, did. Yeah, it, on. did. it did. And, and you know, it's honestly it was true. I, I mean, it's like today, yeah, you know, today the sort of the Turkish Republic, you know, is a. I mean, there's a question about like how much um, foreign policy. Uh, leeway it has, but it's clearly a major, major, major regional player, right? However, the Ottoman Empire in the second half of the 19th century, you know, it did attempt certain reforms, you know, that they were famous for, and some of them, you know, they were ahead of like the Russians, for example. Uh, but basically, in terms of just manpower and income, uh, and the military, it's just uh. Uh, each successive war was worse and worse for the Ottomans, essentially. Mm. So things were just going worse and worse and worse. So, I mean, it was a sick man of Europe. Also, add to this that the... But then again, of course, Austria as well would kind of become, at this point, a sick man of Europe as well, very much so, I think. And it wasn't necessary yeah. for any other empire. At yeah. Maybe at the time that most... I think it's fair to say that most empires at this time... Started yeah, I mean, the sick man. Yeah, I mean, everybody was sick in some way, right? Uh, and on the other hand, I mean, I, I'm not a Habsburg historian exactly, but my understanding is like people actually study these regions. Like I study Russia, or the way I study Russia, like we tend to identify sort of sources of strain, strength, and resilience, and we emphasize more sort of contingent factors that nobody could have accounted for. In other words, why these empires disappear, and we tend to sort of look at you know, the potential that, that these empires had, basically. Mm. So, like, yeah, it was a sick man of Europe, but on the other hand, it doesn't mean it had it, it had to be, you know, had to be put out, you know. It's <laughs> not, not quite the same uh, same thing. Now, of course, let's talk about the reign of Alexander II, and this yeah. is where I believe your book that is called Bankrupt and the Sewers of Imperial Russia comes in, because Alexander is, of course, known as the last great Tsar, and of course, he is most known for abolishing serfdom, and he did reform, do a lot of reform. But he did did almost, as as far as I understand, and almost a little too much reforming, that he would end Israel earlier than mm -hmm. they may, may, might have. But because he got a little too excited, I think, about reforming the empire. So let's talk about the reforms of Alexander the Second. Yes, absolutely. So, so this is indeed kind of my. Uh, my, the, the area, the the time period that I study, uh, 
and especially my first book uh, was about this kind of transition uh, from you know Nicholas's regime into this kind of later late imperial regime, uh, and um, and mostly it's it's about this kind of private property ownership uh, and the law and legal practice and how basically how people who had property like sort of how they they dealt with with that kind of changing uh, changing structures and changing life. And then by bankrupts and usurers, and usurers are, of course, moneylenders who charge excessive interest. And my book was about this kind of culture of personal credit that underpinned, uh, you know, life in Russia and, you know, in other places as well, of course. Um, and right now I'm writing about criminal law and criminal trials in um, 1860s and 70s. And so a lot of that has to do with how Alexander II changed Russia. Uh, and uh, he changed it in a lot of ways. I mean, I do agree that he's uh, exceedingly interesting. And I think like we can say that he was the last great Tsar. I mean, I think like my list of Tsars, I genuinely think were like talented uh, and kind of positive. And what they did was Catherine the Great and Alexander the Second. And Nicholas the First would be number three, I would say, just because of many things that happened during the reforms were actually started under Nicholas the first um so in terms of um the reforms so the the, the the important thing to remember here is that so so the sum are pretty obvious right so Alexander the second abolished serfdom we can talk more about it if you choose to um but rebuilt basically the way the way the way the way local politics worked right and created this kind of public sphere that was you know still limited like you still had censorship but people could discuss a lot of things in print and they could have certain local politics happening. And also he created a new court system that was outside the kind of existing uh, government hierarchy. And, and it was very much to his uh, advantage, basically, because he was afraid that, um, he was basically afraid that his bureaucrats would resist the reforms. And so he wanted to kind of create some independent power centers. Uh, but but the key thing is here, so people say, well, yeah, these were the reforms, but this was not enough. Uh, and of course, it's true that Alexander never actually granted Russia a constitution. He never you know, created anything like a parliament, even a limited one, which by that time in Europe was really, you know, was really the norm, right? So like, no matter how autocratic and conservative the country was, you should have some kind of parliament that would at least pretend to have some power. Right, and there would be some kind of at least officially pro proclaimed, you know, freedom to form parties and have elections, and and he wouldn't do any of those things, and and moreover, he never even created like a real cabinet, in the sense that Alexander, like all the tsars before him and all the tsars after him until Nicholas the Second, acted as his own prime minister. So in other words, it was really difficult to coordinate policy because like the way government worked is that your ministers would come to the Tsar's office, you know, once a week, a couple of times that we can give a report and they would read out what they thought the Tsar would want it to hear and the Tsar would react to that. He would like, yes, sure, you can do this, but not that. Yes, this is, sounds good. Yes, do this. And that would be how government operated. Uh, and it was exceedingly different to do this, difficult to do this because, you know, Russia was a very large country and population was growing, wealth was growing, complexity was growing. And, um, by the time you get to like the 1870s, 1880s, it was very clear that like like this, the possibilities of this kind of uh, weird quasi-liberal regime were kind of running out. And at the end of his life, Alexander II decided to um, basically have more reforms. Uh, and he... No, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for stopping you a little bit. Because I no want worries, to go, please do. Please I, do I, I, I want to go back a little bit. Yeah, because yeah. We, we talked no a little briefly about abolishing, abolishing of serfdom. Absolutely. But how much did it really change for that ex serf to put, for lack of a better word? How much did it, did it improve anything? That Because they were really the last country to have serfs, I think. and yeah. Especially in Europe. Uh, but did it change anything at all for the for the average peasants mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. serfdom were abolished? Well, I mean, I think uh, just to the very basic fundamental way, uh, by the time we get to the mid nineteenth century, uh, sort of the early modern notion of serfdom as basically a form of service, right? So, like you 
basically provide income to these nobles who in turn served the Tsar and his wars, you know, this had changed for a long time and now it was just a source of easy cash. Uh, agriculture during the first half of the 19th century is very profitable and that's why serfdom lasted as long as it did in Russia after Napoleon became this major, major source of foodstuffs, of you know, cereals and other agricultural products that were imported to Western Europe. And so all these nobles, they're suddenly like, this is a nice free cash that they're getting. And so, of course, they they, they didn't want it abolished. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, Russian serfdom, it was not like slavery. So in a sense, the unserved peasants were not like, they were technically not property, like they were human beings who had a religion, certain obligations, uh, who were su not supposed to be like murdered and mistreated with impunity. And as we're moving through the 19th century, the government begins to poke its nose more and more into surf business. Um, and more and more, you know, excessively cruel owners would be, you know, dispossessed, basically get into trouble. Uh, and so the government very slowly lays the foundation for abolishing serfdom in 1861. And it was a huge difference, of course, because like whether you are, you know, you're allowed to marry whoever you want, or whether, you know, somebody just can just beat you up for no reason. I mean, it was a big, big difference. So in terms of just emotional and just kind of a, almost like symbolic life uh, of the peasants, it was a big deal. Um, now, two other very quick things. One is that the serfs and the peasants in generally, they were not just this mon this kind of uniform mass. Like they, different regions had different arrangements. In some, you practiced more agriculture. In the north of Russia, there wasn't really, you know, serfdom officially existed, but like if you wanted to make a money off it, you would have to like let your serfs go and do their own thing basically. And just in exchange for a little bit of a money, right? So, 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 um, so, so, yeah. So, on the one, on the one hand, it was a very complex regime. On the other hand, it didn't just end in 1861 economically and socially, because the emancipation as an economic transaction would continue for about 20 years. Because yes, like personally, the serfs got their freedom immediately. You no, know, like uh, within a couple of years, they even get out of their owner's police authority uh, but uh, land transaction was a completely voluntary deal between the peasant community and the owner uh, and it was basically done on credit so essentially the the government lent money to the peasants to pay off the the nobles so that, that's kind of like to put it in one sentence so it was a complex economic transaction and at first, it was not really clear that it was a good deal for, for the peasants uh, because they still couldn't easily leave their village, at least until all the finances were squared away. And they owed a lot of money to the government uh, and they, the, their former masters were able to take up some of the best land. So only in the later in the 19th century where land values skyrocketed, it actually became clear that on the overall, on the, on the balance, it was actually a good deal for the peasants. But 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 it's 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 a it's probably one of the central issues of modern Russian history is like what happened to these former serfs. Hmm. Now another thing I believe yeah. that Alexander II did was that he reformed the education system. So let's talk about the education system for a little bit before the reform mm -hmm. and what changed during Alexander's re reign. I would say the the biggest change uh, was is that um, I don't remember what was the year again. It was the 18, 1863, I believe. Mm. Uh, but but basically, uh, the biggest change was that the higher education became accessible to just about anybody. You know, as long as you had the necessary, you know, mental capacities to attend a university. So whereas under Nicholas the First, um, universities were you know highly selective. There would be only a few hundred university students in all, all of the empire, uh, and and basically, yeah, I mean it was. Uh, you you would be you know almost more likely to meet a space alien than a university graduate, uh, and basically the, the the Russian Empire, the the government, the business uh, had insatiable demand for educated personnel. Uh, and what Alexander II did is he kind of like opened the gate basically, uh, and suddenly you had like thousands of students, 
And it was quite an amazing deal. And you can read about this in you know, some of the famous Russian fiction from its time, you know, including Dostoevsky, because you could have somebody from the you know, lower middle classes, basically, who managed to scrape together some money to pay university fees. All right. And so like you leave through your student years, basically you rent, you know, portion of a room from somebody and you get extra cash by giving lessons to high school students. And you're like, you treat it as complete, you know, scum of the earth, basically. All of a sudden, then you you graduate and you become an elite official and you're like part of the most respected group uh, in all of the empire. You make policy and everybody respects you. So it's quite a striking transformation. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of the level of education below that, uh, they were these kind of continuing uh, transformation that actually went back to, you know, the early 19th century and Alexander I. It was actually Alexander I who set up a network of universities and a network of higher schools uh, known as gymnasium. And basically later Tsars just kind of expanded on it. And but But they did go back and forth on like how liberal these places would be basically how much censorship, how much self-governance there would be. But overall, uh, late 1850s and early 1860s was the time, was not a bad time to be a young, educated person. Um, there was a lot of sort of, uh, you know, a lot of, um, how, to, how to put it this way, uh, uh, a lot of free thinking, free thinking happening. Uh, no, I do believe there is a revolutionary movement going on as mm -hmm. well. That's believed that you know only reform, true reform can happen by revolution mm -hmm. and it, i believe i don't know i'm not sure if this would be inspired in marxists later on but this was a group i believe called young russia which almost reminds of the young Turks in the ottoman empire as a name yeah. let's talk about young, the young russia movement yes oh, well okay so well these movements the movements that are happening uh, in Imperial Russia, I mean, there's slightly different what's going to happen in Turkey because, you know, in Turkey, it was more of a revolution from above, I would say. Uh, now what's happening in uh, at this time, yes, I mean, these revolutionaries are going to be very famous because, as we know, they will assassinate the Tsar and numerous other officials. Um, and um, they literally did think that if you carried enough terrorist attacks, that that would shake down the government in such a way that it would agree to basically create either a constitutional monarchy or even better a democratic republic which was really their goal um so the best way to see like so there's this thing um and you know i'm not really going to throw much theory in this podcast obviously mm -hmm. uh but there's this thing called elite theory uh, that basically uh it comes from you know sociology 20th century sociology in part inspired by the russian revolution so there are all these italian and american sociologists who are basically saying that change in our society happens you know not because of some voting uh, or democracy or elections or some big social processes but because you know all the levers of power are controlled by like a few hundred elite individuals who basically call all the shots. Uh, however, there is such a thing as counter elites. So there are other people who are powerful and educated, but they somehow feel themselves excluded. And then, you know, either they basically get co-opted and, you know, are allowed to join in running things or, or they stage a revolution. And that's kind of essential what happens to the Russian revolutionaries because they, for the most part, came from elite families. They're from rich and educated families. Uh, and uh, they were brought up in this kind of idealistic worldview that like you are supposed to make a difference in society, you're supposed to help people, and you're supposed to fight injustice. Uh, and uh, gradually, a lot of them turned to terrorism, but you know, there was not such an unusual uh, uh, thing in Europe at that time. Uh, like, for example, you know, some people tell me that Russia was the birthplace of modern terrorism terrorism and i guess we can agree with that if we haven't heard of ireland for example mm -hmm. uh, or many other parts of mm -hmm. uh, of europe where you had you know people running around blowing things up uh and in fact sort of the first russian uh, revolutionaries well the first like real revolutionary uh, bakunin mikhail bakunin was was an anarchist uh, so he was you know caught fighting on the barricades and extradited to russia uh, and then escaped and was quite a character so so there were these like some groups of the Russians who they're basically involved in the 1848 revolution. 
uh, and they get this idea of forming, you know, engaging in violent resistance, basically. Uh, at first, there are very few of them, but after sort of more peaceful revolutionary circles were, you know, suppressed by Tsarist police, uh, then these people become more and more violent. Sort of another really big uh, issue from, again, we're looking at it from the Tsarist perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was the 1866 assassination attempt. Uh, so in other words, this is still early. The reforms are barely even starting, right? And uh, the Tsar was just you know, walking in the park with his girlfriend and uh, uh, and the uh, US, he was leaving the park. You know, some random dude pulls out a pistol and tries to shoot him and you know, misses because obviously pistols at that time were not exactly accurate. Uh, and uh, you know, the Tsar is shocked, right? Because he thought of himself like he was a nice guy, basically, right? You know, mm -hmm. like you know, he was still a tsar and was supposed to like execute people occasionally, but he was definitely out of all the tsars that Russia had, like I would pick him as like you know the nicest guy of them all. You know, he was a gentle person and tried to rule through, you know. He was trying to be nice to people before he tried anything else. And now, look, they try to shoot him for the first time in Russian history since, you know, like 1801 at least. And the first time just a random person tries to do it. Now, from the revolutionary standpoint, like it was most likely it was not some kind of complicated plot. It was just a random crazy dude basically doing that. Uh, but from the Tsar's perspective, he's like, you know, we allow too much freedom. And so there's a basically a crackdown on various illegal movements. Uh, that would eventually radicalize more and more. Uh, however, now this is going to get a little tricksy, but I'm going to say this in just one sentence. So there are several terrorist attacks, several assassination attempts, especially in 77, 78, 79. And then the government uh, does a very smart thing. It doesn't, doesn't establish a democratic republic or no, but it does uh, put a guy in charge who kind of made a deal with the educated public. And his name was Loris Melikov. Uh, Loris Melikov, who was an interesting politician of Armenian descent, um, but he basically was put in kind of complete charge of the government. Uh, and uh, the Tsar kind of let him, gave him a carte blanche. Uh, and he basically reduced, you know, censorship and police surveillance uh, and kind of like allowed more freedom essentially to, you know, property to educated elites. Uh, who in turn became less radicalized, okay? And that basically got rid of the revolutionary movement as a mass phenomenon. However, the, the small group of revolutionaries who were kind of still radicalized, you know, became more and more so and decided to murder the Tsar, right? And so they basically, uh, there are a small organization known as the People's Will succeeded in, as we all know, in murdering Alexander II in 1881 with a bomb but at that point, the revolutionary movement as a whole was was pretty much like it was gone. It was pretty much done for. Does mm. it make sense? So let's so talk about one of those ironies, basically. Hmm. So let's let's talk about Alexander the Third, after the assassination of, of mm -hmm. Alexander the Second, and how he Absolutely. because he would not become a very popular star. He would. Wouldn't rule for very long, and he didn't have a great relationship with his father either. Yes, I mean that's that's all absolutely correct. Uh, and uh, in terms of popularity, you it depends on who you ask, because among sort of more conservative uh, individuals, you know, back then as well as today, the, he does have something of a cult status, uh, which is a little bit ironic. Uh, now we have the same phenomenon here. Um, Alexander the Second's original heir, Nikolai. Uh, you know, died young, but he was groomed to be the next emperor, much like Alexander II himself had been. Uh, and uh, by all accounts, would have been a wonderful Tsar, um, really, from what we know about him. However, he had, uh, well, from what we understand, it was spinal meningitis caused by falling from a horse at a young age. And so in 1865, I think, uh, Grand Duke Nikolai died, and Alexander uh, Alexander Alexandrovich, the future Alexander III, becomes the heir. Now there's the same deal. Um, he did not get a good education, uh, and he was not very academically minded. Um, he was not exactly stupid or anything like that. He was not like mentally disabled. Let's put it this way, but like he was not a highly intelligent person the way Alexander II had been. Uh, and uh, more, but 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 also, it's not true that he was unprepared to reign because 
there was a long, long time for him to prepare, right? So from 1865 to 1881, there's tons of time to get several university degrees. Let's put it this way. So, so basically, like the issue is that Alexander the Third, you know, he had certain, you know, emotional intelligence to you know, pick the right guys as his advisors, but like he didn't really grasp policy, you know, as well as he should have. Let's put it this way. And he was kind of lucky to actually have a good a wife who was intelligent and uh, made up for his lack of charisma. And also, he actually had advisors who were, who were you know, were competent advisors. So something that um, I want to talk about. Sorry for disturbing you there. No, no problem. That want, so something that I want to talk about as well is a censorship of literature that becomes present mm -hmm. under this time. But it's and it's kind of ironic, I think, that one of the few books that actually made it through that will become important for this time is, of course, Das Kapital, written by Karl Marx. Yeah. That becomes very important, especially for a certain mm -hmm. group of people that yeah. we will visit a little bit later on. But it's fascinating that they thought that this book of all things would not be well well read in Russia, which they would be tremendously wrong about. So they thought a little bit about censorship of books and literature and the censorship that get tightened under this time under Alexander the Third. Well, yeah, I mean, sort of. Uh, in terms of um, well, well, the Das Kapital was treated as an academic work and academic stuff. You know, it basically had pretty much you know unlimited leeway, right? To put it this way. Uh, in terms of censorship, um, well, another sort of great reform, quote unquote, of Alexander II was to greatly relax the censorship regime, um, which it was basically the, the sort of the trajectory of Russian history is that censorship was really severe under Alexander I. It was much less so under Nicholas I, and it was gra greatly relaxed during the second part of the 19th century. Now, uh, we should still understand that like newspapers were routinely closed, uh, but, but it would be only after certain warnings. Um, so, uh, so in other words, you know, censorship did exist, but you don't want to sort of make too much out of it. In terms of newspapers, you know, they were basically published without censorship, or rather it was like a post-publication censorship. So in other words, like you publish certain things and you... And then the censor reads it, and he's not happy. And then they're going to give you a warning, basically. And if you do it again, they're going to give you another warning. If you do it a couple more times, then they might easily close the publication. Mm -hmm. But then there would be an option of restarted under a different name, basically. You would find a different editor to serve as a figurehead owner and uh, and restart it. Um, and in terms of works of fiction and uh, scholarship, there was basically, you know, there was hardly any scholar. Uh, censorship um you know at least like the way there was uh, under you know nicholas the first the biggest issue i would say was not in terms of publishing like novels or stories but in terms of theater and theatrical performances right because it was a public performance so that would be much harder so you could like publish your play and that would be one thing but actually actually pre uh, but actually performing it is something else and as you know russia was very heavily christian under the orthodox church so you think that academic work would be, you know, censored heavily. That you could was dangerous, and especially with Das Kapital, you think it would be go mm -hmm. under the censorship because it would kind of undermine the Orthodox Christian Church in in a sense. That yeah. so it's surprising that it made it through, with to yeah. me really, because you know, we considering how conservative the Orthodox Church really is in the, on mm -hmm. these things. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, I mean, they were actually like several kinds of censorship there was the the general censorship there was the imperial court censorship there was the religious censorship then there was the military censorship uh and it's all kind of dependent on where you're going to end up um uh, but uh but yeah i mean that at least that part of it was uh you know like there, there were you know like darwin for example was published like it's um it really wasn't uh, as big of a deal at least at that time even though the imperial government um during this time we're talking about uh, in the late 19th century, you know, it did crack down on sort of some religious dissenting groups, and that's true. And uh, uh, there were a lot of restrictions against the Jews um, as well. 
Uh, so that's all happening. But even, you know, various national movements uh, were kind of cracked down on. And I'm not just talking about Poland, but also famously Ukraine, where the initial um, Ukraine file kind of direction among the sort of St. Petersburg society in the early 1860s would change after 1863 and the Polish uprising and the result in the so-called Valuyev circular, which, which did not ban the Ukrainian language. That's kind of a, that's, that's a myth. Uh, what it did ban is basically um, um, kind of school literature in English um, and like uh, many types of academic literature uh, in English, in Ukrainian, of course, in Ukrainian. So it's like, it would basically, you would be allowed to write, you know, sort of fiction and poetry and certain kinds of like ethnographic works in Ukrainian, but you would not be allowed to like have a Ukrainian school or publish textbooks in Ukrainian or publish some kind of political texts in Ukrainian. No, uh, this is but, but, a, so, sorry for interrupting you again, but it's uh, mine. I'm not sure that this was the case under Saris Russia, but Timothy Snyder, I'm not sure you've seen his lecture on the making of modern Ukraine. He talks about how in uh, especially under Soviet Union, and that this might as well be true under Tsarist Russia, that, you know, in Ukraine, you can take the exam, exam in Ukrainian, but you will not be able to go any further with your exam. But you, if you took it in Russian, you can mm -hmm. get government positions, etc. You had great, yeah. uh, you had greater advantage, but it was, it, you could take it in mm -hmm. Ukrainian, but that wouldn't get you anywhere, basically. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So it's like, uh, you know, to this day, after you know, 30 years of independence, you know, it's it's very sort of, you know, there's some scholarship and science and so on in Ukrainian, but like, you know, it's not really, uh, has it hasn't really developed very far. And to a large extent, it, it is because, um, and I mean, the, obviously the Tsar's government would make a lot of mistakes uh, during that, those, that final 50 years uh, of its existence. Uh, but uh, but basically, yeah, so like education, you know, higher education and scholarship and so on in Ukrainian were so were basically suppressed. Uh, in contrast, uh, in the early Soviet state, uh, there would be primary education in Ukrainian, which basically ensured that a Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian language, you know, survived. Uh, but that did not sort of, uh, I mean, my colleague Tim Snyder is absolutely correct in that, uh, um, you know, of course, there was sort of a glass ceiling. So like, you know, there there were certain subjects and certain professions that you could acquire on Ukraine in Ukrainian, but uh, there were basically limits. And now, in terms of Imperial Russia that we're talking about, like I wouldn't say there's like some kind of big anti-Ukrainian sentiment or anything like that. It's just Ukrainian nationalism is, uh, you know, there are many kinds of it too, but like certain kinds of of it are like they're viewed as a threat basically. Uh, and uh, that that doesn't mean like there are no Ukrainian groups and circles and so on. I mean, they do exist. And importantly enough, after 1905, all these restrictions disappear. Mm -hmm. So like, it's not correct to say like that the Tsars banned Ukrainian language because like they didn't ban all of it. Mm -hmm. And after 1905, all that, that ban was lifted. Mm -hmm. um, now, something that I, as well that is important for... As you know, Russia will stretch from St. Petersburg all the way to the coast, almost bordering with Japan, which, which will become later, important later, but all the way to Manchuria. But what is important under Alexander III is that, of course, the railroads will come to Russia as well. And, of course, the building of the Trans-Siberian Railway will become hugely significant. So let's talk about the building of the trans Siberian Railway yes. under Alexander III, mm -hmm. which is will become significantly yes. important. Uh, yes, it's a very important subject, of course. Uh, and uh, the sort of the the Russians have been you know, present in the Pacific since the middle of the seventeenth uh, century, uh, but they greatly strengthened that presence uh, during the so-called Opium Wars um, uh, in the eighteen forties, fifty, well, and then eighteen sixties. Uh, when basically the Russians managed to get a big chunk known as the maritime region today, a big chunk that was formerly under Chinese um, rule, uh, basically get it in exchange for being um, let's go-betweens with England and France. Uh, and uh, 
And then so all of a sudden, you know, the Russians had a big, big, big piece of uh, Far Eastern territory and they're trying to decide what to do with it because there was a very big danger that, uh, uh, that, that countries like Britain, France, or the United States, or even Japan, you know, would try to take it away eventually. And so there's this, potent, this thinking in Petersburg that on the one hand is the strategic question of like, of other great nations not getting there first, uh, but also this thinking that this could be like the next new Russia, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, this could be like the next great economic uh, opportunity uh, where we can move excessive peasant population from European Russia and uh, it's going to be the land of prosperity. Even some of the uh, earlier Russian geographical names uh, in that part of the world reminded you of the earlier Greek project and an attempt to take over Constantinople. Right, so so the Russians are like trying to do this. However, as we're moving into 1870s and 80s, it's clear uh, a couple of things. One is that it's not going to be as easy as it was in Ukraine, um, because you know the infrastructure is not there, the nature is much more difficult, uh, and the distances are huge. And so, actually, the idea that all we need to do is build a railroad that leads to Siberia, it's actually you know it's a very old idea. It's like started in. Um, um, like, like 1860s and 70s, like there were already projects for, for, as soon as the Russians started building a railway network, they're like, oh, we should build it all the way to Siberia. Uh, but it took that long to just create a project that was viable because it was just so difficult. And so in real life, they started building it only in 1891 under Alexander I. And his uh, finance minister, Sergei Vita, W-I-T-T-E, one of the most important, most interesting persons in, in Imperial Russian history was basically kind of like under underwriting that project essentially. Mm. So, um, I mean, I can continue if you want, but but I'm actually what to do uh, to do to derail a little bit from Alexander III because someone that yeah. becomes impo very important in all the modern Russian or late Tsarist Russian history is of course the Ulyanovs. And I'm talking about his his older brother, of course, Alexander oh, okay. Ulyano, who would as, who would become the brother to the famous Vladimir Ulyano, whom I'm not going to give anything away, but if you know your Russian history, you know, of course, I'm talking about. So I'm not going to spoil anything for now, but let's just to say that the Ulyanos is very important for Russian later mm -hmm. Russian history. Okay, so should we go into that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So, so it's actually you know, it's pretty easy to connect in the sense that the, this expansion in the Far East that we talked about was related to basically the growth of modern capitalism in Russia, mm -hmm. and how uh, basically the Russians were thinking a hundred years ahead, and how uh, the Far East and Siberia was going to be like the next center of capitalist development. And so, even though conserv uh, politically speaking, Alexander the Third was pretty conservative. In other words, you know, suppressed any kind of revolutionary movements and uh, tried to go back on some of the great reforms. But economically, it was you know, quite liberal. And uh, so we have more and more railroads, more banks, more companies, more manufacturing. You know, all of it has taken off in the 1880s and early uh, 1890s. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, as elsewhere in Europe, it uh, there's a social reaction. So again, there's a certain group of educated elite that basically thinks that this capitalist transition is being you know, mismanaged. And then, of course, Marx and Marxist ideology explains, you know, why it's happening. Uh, and so by the time you get into the early 1890s, you know, you have these certain uh, Marxist groups um, emerging in, in, in the Russian Empire, uh, and they basically kind of like inherit their sort of drive, right? They're sort of like organization from these earlier groups that had killed the Tsar earlier. And, you know, they mostly were rounded up by the police. But but what survived is that, you know, there are sort of small vestiges of that. Uh, but what's most importantly, what survived is like the very culture and the idea that you can have an underground culture of a revolutionary resistance. So these people weren't doing very much in the 1880s, but they, they still existed. And like, it was like almost, you know, the just simply having an illegal organization was like was like the big deal, right? Mm. And so in the uh, 1890s, as there are more and more discontented factory workers emerging, uh, and that's where um, these kind of groups of underground activists are trying to form actual uh, political parties, essentially. Um, 
So, uh, and indeed, uh, Vladimir Ulyanov uh, was one of the first organizers uh, of these kind of groups. And, you know, he was by no means the only one, like he was not the first Russian Marxist, not, and he wasn't even the most important one. It's just, you know, as we know, he would end up taking over the Russian Empire in 1917. That's why we pay attention. Uh, one, uh, sort of in one sentence, though, uh, that I think would give you some flavor of how that culture functioned. Um, and, and, you know, like he would move in and out of exile and so on. Uh, but it was basically like a network of secretive, diffuse kind of network of activists whose job was mostly to prepare other activists. Uh, so like Lenin would publish this newspaper called a Spark or Iskra mm. uh, and smuggle it into Russia. Uh, and try to basically working very hard to basically start up little circles all over the place, all over the Russian Empire. But that's really sort of all he was doing until the 20th century. Now, of course, his brother as well, he would become what I would call perhaps radical, if for lack of better terms. But he, so let's talk about his assassination attempt. Yeah. Um, He's an Alexander Ileano, his bro Lenin's brother, of course. And they, they haven't changed the name yes. to Lenin yet, which he won't do until the early mm -hmm. 20th century. But that his own brother, Alexander Ileano, would, of course, be known to as, And this would change Lenin's life, essentially, his assassination attempt on the Tsar. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so Alexander Ulyanov was, uh, he was just kind of in some ways, like almost like more promising than Vladimir. I know very sort of a good student, very dedicated, focused, um, strong-willed. Uh, and uh, ideologically, I would say like he was the descendant of this earlier uh, so-called populist uh, or people's will, these kind of earlier movements, uh, and did in fact, you know, try to kill uh, Emperor Alexander III, which was, you know, much more difficult to do because um, he was basically living under constant, you know, constant... Um, protection unlike alexander the second um uh, but basically that plot didn't get very far and in, unless i'm blanking it was 1887 that's when he was uh uh the plot was uncovered you know there were several plots like that it's just this one was the most dangerous one i think it was 1887 unless i'm completely demented uh but um but but in other words it was like in the middle of uh, alexander the third's reign uh, and there is this story, at least this kind of Soviet era story that came up that basically Lenin, part of Lenin's drive uh, to destroy the monarchy was vengeance for his brother. And, uh, you know, it's really not impossible uh, that, that that was part of it. Um, however, I know there were many other revolutionaries who were just as driven. Uh, and so I think there, there's all, reason, all the reasons to believe that, like, if there was no Alexander uh, Ulyanov, and uh, or if he hadn't been executed, then he would basically still have the same, you know, same Vladimir Ulyanov. Uh, uh, but uh, but I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it didn't make him any kinder, <laughs> or you know, it didn't make him any less of a revolutionary. Uh, that, that I'm sure that's accurate. Uh, but it would so, have but, a great impact on Lenin's life, essentially, wouldn't it? I mean, directly. Um, I mean, uh, it, it, it's probably helped to kind of to kind of spark him uh to spark like his participation in various illegal activities but again like various student circles and uh, demonstrations and students being basically like, expelled from one university and would end up in another university like it was all you know pretty common uh you know it happened all the time during that time so like students were kind of like famous for their radicalism uh, so I think it's pretty safe to think like he probably would continue doing the same stuff. And then look, it's not that Lenin decided to be a professional revolutionary like immediately. You know, he was a, mm. a lawyer for a little while. And actually, to my big surprise, uh, believe it or not, he was actually a very effective uh, defense counsel for a while. Like he, you know, he won cases. Um, no, they were not like serious life and death ones, but you know, he was a good thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, pardon? Oh uh, well, I I was just gonna say like eventually, he would basically form what became known as the Social Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, official foundation is eighteen ninety eight, but you know there wasn't much of a party for until after the revolution of nineteen o five, and then the other party, 
was basically the okay. direct descendant of the earlier groups uh, known as the Social Revolutionary Party that was, you know, not Marxist, but more populist. It was more directed towards, you know, the peasants, but also like rural elites, like elites, I mean, teachers, agronomists, doctors, uh, basically low-level army officers. These were the SRs, the Social Revolutionaries, whereas Lenin's party thought that the that, uh, factory labor, especially skilled factory labor, would be the sort of the foundation of their movement. I'm sorry for jumping ahead from Alexander Third because we've been speaking quite a while already, so we have to jump in to the last Tsar, Nicholas II. Let's begin with his upbringing because yep. it is during his youth that he meet, I believe, Alexandra, who will become his wife, of course, and mm -hmm. under for someone, I'm a certain monk that we will come and discuss later, yeah. I'm sure. So let's talk about Alexander, sorry, Nicholas. Yes. Of Nick seconds of upbringing mm -hmm. and how we met Alexandra as well, because his his father, while he was still alive, Alexander III did not want him initially to marry Alexandra, as far as I understand. Yeah, I mean that was a that was definitely a sort of a, I mean there were several potential brides there. Like there was, for example, uh, a descendant of the French royal dynasty that they were looking at, but uh, but basically yes, so. Uh, th th there was there was sort of a conflict, a latent conflict uh, between the heir to the throne and his family. And again, this is important to remember that these kind of conflicts and issues were kind of like the staple of dynastic life, right? I mean, we can even see it this day. <laughs> you know, certain European monarchies, I don't want to mention. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of the Russian Empire, on the one hand, Nicholas was given like all the resources to be a competent Tsar when he inherited. Like he uh, got top-notch military education, a university education. He had a considerable amount of experience in that as soon as he was old enough to do it, he was allowed to sit in on all the various committees. And uh, mm. like, for example, the, the Trans-Siberian Railroad Committee, he was part of it. Uh, I believe he was involved in the Famine Relief Committee in the early 1890s. Now, on the other hand, this was not the, getting this experience was not the same as actually getting um, a feel of what it's like to be the Tsar, and that's a really important point because, like all other rulers, Alexander III was very jealous of his prerogatives, and he didn't want to like give too much leverage to his heir before it was time. And now what happened uh, What happened uh, as the result is that Alexander III died very suddenly of a kidney disease, and, uh, like literally over just a few months, before he really had a chance to groom Nicholas. Uh, because, look, it's one thing to get an education or sit in on some bureaucratic meetings, but what the Tsar really did as a ruler is remember what I already said. You had to meet with your ministers and listen to their reports. So you had to, it's, it's almost like academic work, like you have to sit in, at this meeting, listen to very concentrated text where like every word matters. And you had to understand what that other guy is trying to do or trying to get you to do. And you have to decide right there on the spot, what are you going to let him do or not, right? So it's a very, very tough trick. Uh, and so Nicholas II, as the heir, was allowed to do this a couple of times uh, when his father had been sick earlier, but he didn't really have an ex extensive experience. And he was still like in his 20s, but like it was not his age as much of a problem as that he, again, like he didn't get a real feel of what it's like to be a top executive. The only part he understood is that you're supposed to play your ministers against each other and that he did pretty well. OK, so so that part he understood and he would continue to do it until he himself would go to the trash bin of history. But but he did share his father's conservative values. And and what I mean, I mean by conservative, you know, remember, conservatism is a modern idea. Right. So we're not like literally trying to recreate the past. We're trying to borrow certain things from the past and bring them back. Uh, and uh, the and the thing what what these Tsars, the last two Tsars especially, were trying to do. Well, they, they, you know, they like to dress up in these archaic 17th century outfits and so on. However, what, what they were, the reason why they were doing is that they were terrified of the growing might of the modern state, right, of bureaucracy, of experts, you know, of lawyers and engineers and various, uh, various other kind of technocrats. Uh, and they were afraid that like, their power would completely evaporate if you let these people take over too much. And so the last two Tsars, they're trying to do everything they can. They're trying to build this symbolic connection to the Russian people, 
uh, or they're trying to listen to all kinds of informal advisors. And there are many, many, many of them. And Rasputin that you can ask me about later was only one of them. So they're trying to do everything they can to like basically cut the red tape between them and the people. And honestly, uh, it was a very modern idea. So it was not that stupid because look, the 20th century is going to have many, many dictatorships, right? And charismatic rulers and dictators and authoritarian kind of regimes. So like the, so, so it wasn't all that unusual that the last two times would try, or their advisors would try to start something like that. But you know, eventually it was gonna, it was gonna, it, it will end the way it will end, as we all know. No, um, it's my, it's my understanding. That I have the opportunity to do a constitutional monarchy, and I want to ask if you had chosen to go into a constitutional monarchy, and I believe on Robert K. Massey as well argues that he would have been a great constitutional monarch, but he wasn't really fit to be autocrat. But would the history of Russia have been any different if he had chosen to have been an auto be a, be a constitutional monarch? Yeah. Or would it have ended with the revolution in 1917? Yeah. And and it would probably would have entered the war and it anyways, right? But would would it have ended in the revolution of 1917 anyway, even if you had chosen the drama constitutional monarch. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably right. Uh, the sort of the, the couple of uh, issues here is one is that there have been several proposals uh, beginning in the 1860s uh, that actually like went all the way through the red tape, all the way through the bureaucracy, and it went all the way to the Tsar. And the, the Tsar, and first Alexander II, and then Alexander III, they would turn them down eventually. But again, shortly before his death, Alexander II approved a very limited project. But the thing is that even though it was limited, once the Tsar decided to do something, like it was not easy to undo it. Mm -hmm. So once the Tsar agreed to any kind of constitution, like that, like that was it. That was it, right? And now he was assassinated, like literally on the day he was supposed to sign it into law. Um, but um, so, so the idea was clearly in the air. Uh, and I mean, I think like the Russian elites were kind of ready for it. Uh, and I think uh, Nicholas II uh, just simply, you know, in retrospect, it's easy to say that, but it's pretty clear what the recipe for success was, is that like, yes, you could have an autocratic, charismatic kind of dictatorship of like 20th century style. Uh, it was possible to do it, but you needed two things is that one, you needed some form of even faked, but some kind of like popular legitimation, right? And then thing number two is that instead of trying to cut out the bureaucracy, you needed to take bu the bureaucracy over and expand it and strengthen it. So had the Nicholas done these two things, that then yes, it would have been a very different history, okay? So, but, but yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think he would have been a much better constitutional monarch. Um, just from we know, I mean, he did believe that it was his duty to basically to rule Russia. But in terms of his habits and lifestyle, you know, he enjoyed you know car rides and you know and the uh, and hunting parties a lot more than actually ruling. Uh, uh but it, it's important to remember though is that by 1917 Russia did have a constitution and did have a constitutional system. And which which Russia acquired in 1905 during the so-called revolution of 1905, and we can sort of jump in there if you want. Yeah, that I that we don't. I'm sorry for skipping a few years of 1901 to 1905, but let's talk about 1905 revolution, which became essential, and the creation of the Duma, which was followed. Mm -hmm. And another thing that, of course, is important in 1905 is the Russo. That I kind of think paved the way for the 1905 revolution was the Russo-Japanese war that started right mm -hmm. before the revolution broke out. So let's talk about some of the two perhaps most important things that come out mm -hmm. of 1905, which would be a disaster. Both would be a disaster of Nicholas II. Yes, and I, and I think absolutely all of that is true. And I think if we want to dig into the heart of it, is the fact uh, that would be the fact that Nicholas II was still acting as his own prime minister until 1905. In other words, he tried to keep his hand on everything and everything that was happening in the Russian Empire. At the same time, he doesn't believe in bureaucracy, right? So it's like a sort of contradiction, right? Yeah. Uh, and so what you have is you have this disastrous foreign policy in the Far East, 
where the Russians basically pick a fight with Japan. You know, we thought it was going to be Japan that they invaded. wanted to have in Manchuria at that time, right? Which was so, guaranteed under Japanese serenity, I think. Yeah, so like the Russians, well, it was not even, I mean, Manchuria was part of it, but basically, so the Russians gradually uh, got involved more and more in the Far East at first, in what today is Russian, the Russian Far East, then they occupied Manchuria and occupied uh, this little portion at the very southern end of Manchuria with a fortress known as Port Arthur. I think in Chinese, it's known as Lu Xun. It's essentially a, the gateway to China, ultimately. Mm. It's like, if you hold that little area, you control china basically like that's just the or at least strategically speaking and the russians you know managed to get their hands on it before like the british or the japanese did uh and so uh it was like this last spurt of imperial expansion the russians build like an extra railroad that's cutting through uh manchuria through northeast china uh and uh and that of course you know does create a little bit of a tension there however the japanese at that point are still prepared to you know, kind of accommodate the Russians. It was what the Russians did next that made the war inevitable, which would be that after this, the Russians wanted Korea, or at least to keep the Japanese out of Korea, but mm -hmm. ideally to actually have another dependency in Korea. And this is something that the Japanese government, uh, and especially, you know, Western bankers who were paying the Japanese government, um, this is really, this is kind of really what sort of made war kind of, Pretty much in, inevitable, in other words. Uh, but it was, uh, it was the, uh, it was the, um, the the Japanese Empire that started the war by attacking Port Arthur, and because the Russian army, you know, the Russian army was much bigger, uh, and potentially, you know, should have defeated, should have defeated Japan. However, you know, it was very far away, and there were certain intellectual things, just like during the Crimean War, of like how certain things were done. We don't logistic have time. was a big part of it. <laughs> To it. Yeah, I mean, certain parts of the logistics, basically like which troops you brought over when, and, and I would say it wasn't even so much, like eventually the Russians had a huge army in the Far East. It was just like by that time, the strategy and leadership was like, were so exhausted uh, that uh, basically the Russians should have won the land war there, but they didn't. And most importantly, the Russians spent like countless billions of rubles on building up the third navy in the world after English and the French. And that navy was completely sunk. Uh, and that was basically the uh, that, that was basically the, the thing that doomed that doomed Russia. Hmm. So of course uh, another, let's talk about as well as the, it was a disaster yes. the 1905 revolution was a disaster for the, yes, absolutely. For the Russian Russian uh, for, for, for the Russian Empire. But let's Talk about another happening at the same time, and yes. uh, which was you know the Nineteen mm -hmm. Five Revolution led by Adolf yep. Trotsky. Mm -hmm. So so these things are happening all at the same time. Now it's important to remember that like just because things happen at the same time doesn't mean like one is like the sole cause of the other. However, yeah. you know, it was definitely a contributing factor because you know, you know for every Russian Tsar being successful in war was like really really important mm. and losing a war especially to an opponent that was considered to be weak and inferior you know in all kinds of like racial ways even you know it was a huge huge embarrassment but there were sort of a couple of other things and so there probably would have been still a revolution uh, even if there hadn't been the war with Japan uh, uh, because like there were sort of a couple of factors one is that there was a very massive constitutional movement in the Russian upper classes for like several years. And the Tsar just kept kind of promising and limited innovation over and over and over again until basically he couldn't go on anymore. Now, the second thing is there is an economic crisis that's even not even like directly related to uh, the war with Japan. It's kind of a worldwide crisis. So in other words, industry all over the world is kind of taking a big hit including Russian factory workers who are now like starting to protest and strike even more, okay? Now, so so if you put these three things together, then you get the fact that uh, beginning in early 1905, the more one strikes, uh, various elite individuals go over uh, and uh, also kind of refuse to cooperate with the government. Uh, and, and then what happens is that the Tsar's closest advisors, which was Sergei Vita, uh, and the Grand Duke uh, Nicholas, Nicholas, Nikolai Nikolaevich, his cousin, I think, was his 
It was like, I mean, I can reconstruct the relationship, but it doesn't matter. Sort of the most important Raman of Grand Duke, um, who was not the Tsar himself. Uh, so they basically forced Nicholas II to actually issue a real constitution, not a fake one. So that's mm -hmm. essentially what's going to happen. Uh, and, uh, and and so what Nicholas does, so he issues this constitution where you would have most normal political freedoms and a parliament. And at the same time, the imperial army remains loyal to the Tsar and it's used to crush the revolution essentially. So kind of to make a long story short. Now, I want to take a second and take a look at the Roman of Children because they've been going to mm -hmm. another event that in 1905 that happened that would change the, the life of the Romanovs across the entry of Rasputin, the mad Gregory mm -hmm. Rasputin known as the mad monk. So let's talk about for a second what the Roman of Children and how, of course, mm -hmm. that's our Alicia Alexei who how, would have hemophilia and how this would play a part into mm -hmm. Rasputin saving a child. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that's a kind of one of the most famous stories from Imperial Russia is that, so the Tsar basically had four daughters in a row, and then finally in 1904, he has a son who's sick with hemophilia. Uh, and of course, everybody knows, well, everybody knows what that is. Um, and uh, apparently hypnosis at that time, you know, still to this day, is an effective way to kind of ameliorate the symptoms. Uh, and so it happens that there was a sort of a long, long sequence of various informal advisors and charlatans that were kind of hanging out the, around the imperial court. And it was Rasputin, he was not actually a monk, he was just kind of an adventurer, really. Um, but he basically ended up being introduced to the imperial family, you know, displaced the previous ones and supposedly because he was able to uh, to do this kind of hypnotic treatment and uh, save the, the, the heir uh, that he became a close friend to the imperial family. However, it's highly unlikely that he actually had a sexual affair with the empress. Mm -hmm. That's again an example of political pornography that's uh, and that was just as, uh, as widespread at, at, at that time as a, a century before that. Mm. Um, so, so that was essentially uh, the, the kind of issue with the imperial family. But the thing is that so this was like an extra pressure point on the Romanov dynasty. If your heir is clearly not going to live very long, uh, and then all the other grand dukes, uh, you know, there, there wasn't, and there were some really good ones and intelligent ones and educated ones. Uh, it's just they weren't really allowed any power. The ones who were allowed power were no good. And then there were a bunch of others who entered this kind of morganatic marriages. I mean, it's really sort of sociologists would tell you like that's basically how dynasties operate. You know, basically all the kind of outsiders who are not in the center of power, they would end up marrying random people and losing their dynastic rights. Uh, but the question is like, even though there are you know, hundreds of grand dukes at that point, uh, there wasn't really any obvious question of like what you're going to do with the succession, mm. and that was a that was a big deal. I believe his most one of the most recent biographers, Godfrey Smith, argues in his book a biography on Rasputin that he was really just in the right time, place at the right time. Mm -hmm. How we managed to calm him down that he did, yes. but obviously he doesn't have it really it's less. Mm -hmm. powers in this healing powers in this sense but it was just there yeah. in the right place at the right time i think so too so i have a, about like 15 minutes left i would say yeah so that's we fine. should try to yeah have to pick up my, <laughs> yeah. my kid is good believe that's it or not my kid my I kid is going to be back for three school. hours now so that you should really round it up so yeah my daughter is going to be back from school and she just <laughs> started <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's just uh, uh, quickly go uh -huh. over the years from when and Rasputin in the Nicholas Romanov's lives, and of course, and what led up until uh, led up until the World War One. Yeah. Uh. So well, it was obviously obviously was the the end of the dynasty and the end of Imperial Russia. Uh. What would be the couple of things? Well, uh, the one very sort of famous way to explain what happened in World War One is that. Russia just basically performed miserably and and was defeated, right? And mm. and um, we're not going to go into sort of a blow by blow account. Um, uh, what what we have to say is that like every other major participant, Russia came into the war very severely unprepared. You know, it was obviously fighting alongside Britain and France and against the Central Powers. 
of Germany, the Ottoman Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, in Bulgaria. Um, so it was, you know, very much unprepared. Uh, like all the other uh, major participants, Russia had to make extraordinary sacrifices and kind of big transformations in terms of like turning their economy in this kind of like modern industrial techno war kind of uh, system, uh, which which the Russians did do, by the way. Um, so uh, with, with large losses, not as successfully as others. But, you know, by the time we get into like 1916, uh, it had enough ammunition, definitely had enough soldiers. Uh, and then in terms of the results, um, we know that the Russians suffered grievous losses especially in what today is Poland and, and, you know, Eastern Prussia at that point against Germany. Uh, but, you know, not uniformly so. It was a very kind of unpleasant experience for the Germans as well. Uh, but by the end of 1915, the Russians had to evacuate the Russian Poland and all the other Western borderland, Lithuania and parts of Belarus. And that was a big defeat, right? Very bloody, very sort of very unpleasant, very damaging. However, the Russians, you know, did the same thing to Austria-Hungary. And as a result, the Germany's only real ally, uh, instead of being a partner and a kind of a, a support to the German war effort, became a liability. So instead of getting help from the Austrians, the Germans had to divert their scarce resources to save Austro-Hungarians from, you know, dis from destruction. And the same thing happened with the Ottomans. Instead of just creating a little bit of an irritant irritation to the Russians, the Ottomans were defeated very heavily in the in the Caucasus and Asia Minor, and basically the Germans had to rack their brains how we're going to save the Turks from from being completely you know evaporated. Uh, so my argument is that like there yeah I mean there are certain signs that like that there were certain things like the railway network for example that was cracking by 1917. But like it wasn't cracking any more than it was in Germany that was starving or in France where, you know, you had Germans parked right on outside of Paris. My argument is that if the Russians, you know, it was a big if, but, you know, the, the Germans were not anywhere near any kind of important parts of the Russian Empire. And there was no conceivable way for them to like march to Moscow or to Petersburg. All the Russians had to do was sort of say, sit in the trenches for another year. And they would be among the, you know, the victors in the First World War. And it's a different question of what would have happened later. Uh, so the question is then, then what, if that was true, then why did the empire collapse, right? And here the very famous kind of myth is that it was popular protest. People who were starving, uh, workers who were not getting enough mm. food to eat, who just basically rose up and protested and overthrew the monarchy. And that's kind of like ironically again is like one of those myths that I would myths that I would say because the myth is that the first the February Revolution that removed the Tsar from power was a popular uprising, whereas the Bolshevik takeover later on in October 1917 was a coup. And I would say it was almost like the other way around. And what I mean by that is that the popular uprising was real, of course, but that's not what removed the monarchy from power. Right. So basically, essentially what happens is that, you know, Petrograd, the capital of Petersburg, you know, it had a lot of turbulence, a lot of uprisings and strikes. Uh, but it was only when the Tsarist army was given, you know, very sort of, you know, there was a, given very stupid uh, instructions to suppress those protests by armed force. That's when uh, mm -hmm. those army units that were stationed in Petrograd went over to the revolutionaries. However, at that point, they could still be suppressed because, you no, know, the Russia had like something like 7 million soldiers. They could easily spare like 100,000 and just destroy the uprising. The key figures here were the top generals in the Russian army. And I'm not going to say this wasn't any kind of like a big conspiracy. I don't think that was the case. There wasn't like a big long-standing plan to get rid of the Tsar. However, by the time you get to 1917, everybody recognizes that the Tsar is really incompetent. And the generals think that like, you know what? This is really not going anywhere. We should start, we should try a different Romanov as the next ruler. That's what we should do. And so once the, the people in the headquarters they see that, like, look, the Tsar doesn't know what he's doing. He's making, giving stupid commands. There's an uprising in the capital. The Duma, the parliament members are doing God knows what. What we really need to do is we should get the Tsar to resign and transfer power to a different Grand Duke. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Tsar's 
Nicholas II and his family in exile with, until they get shot out mm-hmm. near Berger. Absolutely, yes. But, uh, since we, and and since there is a great run. book if, uh, on this where by Helen Rappaport where she talks about the Romano sister's life and she speaks about the last and final moments in exile as well. So that's, which is, yeah. if you want to read more about it, of course, I recommend that book. But let's, for now, talk about the last months of their lives in mm-hmm. exile in Siberia. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So uh, this is, I you know, I would write, would join you in these recommendations. Uh, but <laughs> essentially, essentially, uh, it was a little bit of a surprise to everybody that the revolution radicalized so quickly. And instead of having, you know, a constitutional monarchy with, uh, you know, more constitutional monarchy with, uh, with a uh, uh, Grand Duke Alexei, the heir, or maybe the Tsar's younger brother Mikhail as regents. As a regent, uh, instead, you know, the monarchy was overthrown completely and replaced by this, you know, fairly radical government in Petrograd that basically eventually would proclaim Russia as a republic and then lose out to the Bolsheviks in turn. So again, so I'm going to have to run. But to make a long story short, uh, Nicholas II was not allowed to immigrate. He was put under house arrest. There was talk. There was talk about sending them either to Norway or England, but. And, and it was a possibility that they should have yep. gone to England, yeah. although Norway did not want them. Mm-hmm. But you know, and the, the English, the English wouldn't have them basically. Cause... They changed their mind. They were reluctant. They were a little mm-hmm. reluctant, but they changed their mind and not, did not want them eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I mean, it's a, it's kind of a very sad story. Uh, I mean, people are uh, sort of speculating that sort of after, you know, Nicholas was moved, you know, further and further and further to the to the east. Uh, and until he was obviously uh, uh, was moved to the sort of major city in the Urals, Yekaterinburg, today well in Soviet days known as Svetlovsk, uh, and where he would be eventually shot. Uh, you know the question is like, was would it would it be possible to liberate him? I mean, as we know, there were all kinds of uh, attempts and plots and secret correspondence. And uh, the important point that is that even the leaders of the anti-Bolshevik resistance mm-hmm. by that time. Like they didn't believe in the monarchy, and especially they did not believe in Nicholas II. So, like, it really wouldn't have made any uh, much of a difference. It's ironically that the like Russian monarchism as an ideology, as like glorification of the last Romanovs, it really acquired its kind of bang, you know, in the, after 1917, after the civil war in exile, where like all these emigres were, you know, sitting in Paris and playing cards, and they were like, well. If we only liberated Nicholas II, if he did this, if he did that, then monarchy would have been preserved. So, but but it's kind of an afterthought. And at the time, like, not everybody thought like things that were happening were natural. Now, what was not natural is, of course, to murder the Tsar and his family and his servants. You know, that was you know, obviously a, a severe, you know, a crime. Um, that was you know very one of the not the first one, but one of the kind of egregious early crimes of the Bolshevik regime. And of course, in the beginning of the regime, they would, you know, they didn't seem to have, sorry, not in the regime, but, you know, in uh, in exile, they didn't seem to have it bad. Nicholas II, they read a lot, and he, you know, would chop wood every day, but eventually they, they would, the rules would get stricter and stricter and strict, stricter, and in the end, there is, you know, they didn't always allowed to do anything, and then Nicholas II was actually moved with his I don't remember yeah. with who, but he, he was yeah. moved to a different location. And in the yeah. end, of course, they mm-hmm. all got shot by the Bolsheviks. And exactly. So the rest is mm-hmm. Russian history. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I mean, I agree because, like, at first it wasn't really, you know, he was just sitting in his palace under house arrest. Mm-hmm. And I think it was pretty difficult to conceive, like, how it was going to end. Yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So. I think we're going to round it up there. I believe we spoke for almost three hours now. And if you listen this far, do you, do you have a record of people buy your books, bankrupts, of the usurers of, of Imperial Russia? And of course, do you have anything else you want to promote? On, uh, you mentioned a new book you're writing. When, and when you can, can you tell us when it, you, it, when it is coming out? And any social media where people might find you? Well, I I will promote it as is it, it of course, uh, but it is going to be a, a story of criminal trials. So if you guys are interested in true crime and punishment, uh, in um, you know fraud, murder, forgery, uh, 
uh, I'm basically telling the story of these very high profile cases that kind of like shook the Russian public in the 1860s and the 1870s. And basically what it meant for the way uh, Russian politics, Russian society, Russian sort of social power in Russia, you know, was was basically arranged after the emancipation. So uh, I don't have a, uh, there's a working title that I have, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be the final one. So you should probably look it up under my name and uh, maybe in a year and a half or so. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. You're always welcome back, of course. We had this have been well that aged well. We are available on Instagram and well that aged well on Twitter or X, if whatever you call it these days. And there were that aged well. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast. YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on iTunes, please consider writing us a review. That will help us out a lot. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.